Yeah. Senator, they don't pay you enough. Just joking, Louie. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, we've got a quorum present, so we'll get started. Um, welcome to the Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. Apologies for the delayed start. We're still getting used to the new system. Uh, before we get started, uh, I think we'll begin with committee introductions and I'll just, I guess, call on each person by the boxes as I see them and you can just say your name and where you represent. So we'll start out with, rep with the House Chairman uh, Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chris Chiazzo, House District 28, uh, West Scarborough. Senator Farron. Good morning. I'm uh, Senator Brad Farron representing Senate District 3, which is the majority of Somerset County. Great. Representative Kinney. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Mary Ann Kinney. I represent House District 99, and I live in the little town of Knox um, and represent nine towns in Western Waldo County. Great. Representative Dolliff. Good morning. Representative Joe Sandoloff with District 115, which is Roxbury, Rumford, Milton Township, Woodstock, and Sumner. Representative Wood. Hi, I'm Barb Wood, and I represent District 38, which is the western end of the peninsula in Portland. Representative Riley. Hi, I'm Morgan Riley. I represent uh, District 34, which is half of Westbrook. Representative Corey, try to get you right when you're drinking coffee. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm Patrick Corey. I represent House District 25, which is part of Wyndham. Representative Tuttle. Representative John Tuttle, representing District 18, Sanford's East Side. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative McCrate. Good morning, I'm Jay McCrate, representing Harpswell, West Bath, and Northeast Brunswick in the House. Okay. Representative Supika. Good morning, I'm Representative Laura Supika, and I represent District 126, a portion of Bangor. I'm also having connection issues to the internet, and it keeps seizing up and freezing, so I apologize for any issues going forward. Okay. Thanks, Representative. I think we're all having some internet issues today. Um, so with us also, as usual, we have our uh, OPLA analyst, Janet Stoko, and we have our committee clerk, Karen Montel. Uh, so before we get started on the public hearings today, we'll kind of run through the, uh, the general rules. Um, so this committee is assembled uh, electronically today for the purposes of inviting comment on legislation. Before we get started, we're just gonna share a few uh, related information just so that everybody knows how it'll work. So this, com this uh, committee meeting is currently being live streamed on the committee's YouTube channel. This means that anyone who's a participant here today uh, via Zoom can be seen and also heard if their microphone is unmuted. So people on the Zoom uh, meeting waiting to testify, uh, if you're in the attendee waiting to testify, you can't be seen or heard until they're called upon to speak. Um, this meeting will be recorded and available to the public to view on the committee's YouTube channel soon after this meeting uh, has concluded. Uh, if your name, if the name on your Zoom square is not the name you use to register to testify, it might take us a few minutes to try to identify you. Uh, we were doing that a little bit this morning. Um, and as we take members from the public and bring them into the meeting, just so you know, it may look like you're dropped out of the meeting, but it takes a couple of seconds to kick you up and then you'll be brought up as a panelist and you'll be able to speak and testify. So initially it might look a, a little bit like you're being dropped. Um, the use of the chat function, just a reminder, as we put in our committee rules, that that's just for technical issues. If you're having any, it's not for substantive discussion. Uh, if anybody would like to ask questions uh, to speak, if you can use the virtual raise hand function, uh, either myself or uh, Chairman Chiazzo will call on you and we'll, we'll have you speak. Um, as usual with our committee, we use a three minute um, time limit for testimonies. We're a pretty high uh, testimony or high bill load committee. Um, so if you can tailor your remarks to three minutes, we'll kind of let you know when that's expiring. 
and then you can wrap up after that. Uh, so the order of the bills that we're going to take today, we're going to begin with LD 109, an act uh, to facilitate fair ballot representation for all candidates by allowing a candidate's nickname to appear on the ballot. Then we're going to proceed to LD 157, which is an act regarding the fair representative uh, rep representation of candidate identities. Then we'll do LD 59, an act to define the term unenrolled political action committee, and LD 53, an act to limit uh, political advertising. And those may shuffle if we have difficulties finding sponsors or anything like that. Um, so we're, we're going to begin with the sponsors and co-sponsors as usual. And then we'll proceed to people who have signed up uh, in advance with our clerk to testify. And we're going to try to go by for, against, and neither for nor against, but that always isn't included in, in, the, test, uh, in the request to testify. But we'll try to do it like a normal um, committee hearing would go. So with that, I think we will open the public hearing on LD 109, an act to facilitate fair ballot representation for all candidates. Um, and we'll recognize Representative Falkingham. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and members of the Joint uh, Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. Um, I'm glad to be with you here this morning to present my bill. Uh, before I get started on my testimony, I just want to say a thank you to the last legislature that uh, gave me broad support on this bill and this committee that um, I had a majority report come out of this committee last time around. Uh, so the um, this was a bill that, that when I uh, first put it forward, it, it got some attention. I was surprised by that. I had a lot of newspapers call me, um, you know, out of all the bills that I had, this was the one I, I probably got interviewed the most. And of course it got my name in the newspapers and a lot of, a lot of joking around and, and stuff like that. Um, so uh, at, at first people thought it was kind of a, kind of a silly, silly bill, but when people, uh, were explained about it a little bit more than they realized it wasn't a silly bill and it was a, a very good bill. And I think that's why it had so much uh, support. So I'll get into that now. Uh, I am Representative Billy Bob Falkenham. I'm here to present LD 109, an act to facilitate fair ballot representation for all candidates by allowing a candidate's nickname to appear on the ballot. <clears throat> LD 109 allows a candidate to request their nickname appear on the ballot following their legal first name for an election in the state of Maine. The candidate must declare to the Secretary of State that the nickname is actually the name by which the candidate is known to others. This bill provides the voter a clearer and more complete presentation of the candidate and will help to prevent confusion at the ballot box. This bill is about transparency. This bill is about letting the voter know who they are voting for and letting the candidates campaign honestly by using the name they are commonly known. This bill does not create a space issue on the ballot. Uh, my name, for example, W.R. Billy Bob Falkenham um, is no longer than my legal name of William Robert Falkenham. Even if some names are long and others are short, that is just a matter of fact that we deal with already. When the governor vetoed this, uh, the message seemed to promote the bill more than oppose it. In the veto message, the governor demonstrated that a candidate could use electioneering techniques by calling themselves something like the greatest. First of all, if someone did something like that, I think it would guarantee that they would lose. I also don't foresee anyone going through the work of getting on the ballot and all that entails and then proceed to lie to the Secretary of State via a signed sworn affidavit about the name they are commonly known. If that is what they seek to do, the governor has already stated, as have others, that a simple probate court can change the name and the Secretary of State would have no recourse. So if a probate court can change your name in a matter of minutes, then what is the need for this bill? Well, for me, I don't want to legally change my name. I am proud of the name that my parents gave me. My first name, William, is after my great-grandfather, a two-war veteran of the Spanish-American War and World War I. 
He was named after his father, who was a Mason in the city of Alexandria. He set the last stone in the Washington Monument. I am very proud of my given name. My middle name is Robert. I am named Robert after my grandfather, Bob, a World War II veteran who received a Purple Heart in the Pacific Islands from a mortar shell fighting the Japanese. I am very proud of my middle name and its connection to history. I would never legally change it. I feel like the suggestion of changing my name is insulting to my parents and myself. Now I'd like to tell you a short story. A couple months after being elected, I was having some lobster traps delivered to my house. About midway through unloading 100 traps, we started discussing politics. At that point, the man unloading the traps said he was the only person he voted for that won was that Falkingham. And I said, oh yeah, who? And he said, that William Falkingham, you must know him. And I laughed and said, yeah, you know, you're talking to him. And we both laughed, but that's an honest example of why we need to pass this law. This law is about transparency and people should know who they're voting for. I've been called Billy Bob my whole entire life, but the one name I've never been referred to is William Robert. I bet if I asked the people on this committee who Harold Stewart III is, no one would raise their hands. Um, even if one didn't raise their hand, that's too many. But we all know his name is Trey Stewart. He was given the name Trey because he's the third. And that's a connection that a lot of people don't make. Just like some people can't make the connection that William Robert is Billy Bob. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't make the connection that Trey stands for third. There are uh, also reasons that are more com complex than these examples. Some citizens have names that are not common in America. Uh, these are mostly immigrant names or names from religions like Islam. There are many Muslim names that are extremely long and difficult for some Mainers to pronounce. I'll give you an example. I have a really good friend who is Iranian. He came to the United States when his family fled Iran in 1979. His name is Sherem. Because it wasn't a common name here, most people had trouble with the name. He told people to call him Sean. This is the name everyone has called him since childhood. Everyone knows him as Sean. If he wanted to run for office, he should be able to run as Sean. It would be the name that people know. Uh, it's the name he uses in everyday life. It would also be a way that he could avoid implicit bias on the ballot. To not allow the accepted uh, known name uh, shows inherent racism in our election laws. Uh, I'd like to give you another example of why this law could have future ramifications. I was watching television and a credit co card commercial came on. There was a young man working on a project, building something, the commercial goes along and the young man is sitting on a couch with his mom reading through a book of names. He then declares to his mother that he's decided on a name. The mother is proud and supports the son. The moral of the story being told in this commercial is that the young man is transgender and was given a female name at birth. At the end of the commercial, the credit card company says, we will honor your chosen name and print it on your credit card. It was at that point that I realized credit card companies are more progressive than Maine's election laws. Can you imagine forcing a young man like this to run on the ballot with a female name? Our current laws are transphobic and need to be corrected. There are many more examples like these and there will be many more in the years to come. Please join me in passing LD 109 to improve future elections. I'll answer any questions that the committee has. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Falkingham. Any questions from committee members at this time? Uh, Representative Kinney. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was reviewing uh, the bill from the 129th. Um, I was not on this committee, so I wanted to see what the committee had come up with exactly, um, which it looks like we the what we voted on in the House uh, and the Senate last, last time eliminated sections four, five, seven and eight 
uh, from from your bill, and I noticed you put them back in for this this round. And another question that I saw come up was concerns over what some if someone has a somewhat offensive nickname, which can happen, and they may be very well known by that. I, would you have any suggestions on how we could maybe uh, uh, work on putting that in there uh, without violating like freedom of speech type issues? Uh, yeah, the uh, the solution to that is that the person who's requesting the nickname has to sign a sworn affidavit that uh, says that is the name that they're that they're known by. Um, <clears throat> I think that that legal ramification uh, is is pretty good threshold to cover that. Um, and then it's been it's been stated over and over again, that if someone wanted to put something on the ballot just for that purpose, that there's a, already a method that they can do that. They can go to the probate court and have their name. Uh, and this is something I've been saying over and over. Uh, it's very, very simple probate court process. They could go and they could have something extremely uh, vulgar uh, put on there. And th if at that point, the Secretary of State has absolutely no recourse but to print it on the ballot, they could, uh, you know, I'm not even going to say it out loud, but they could say something very horrible, go to a probate court, have that on there, it, it would be um, absolutely nothing they could do about it. So that process is already there. So it's, to, to me, this is a non issue. Quick follow up, if I may, Mr. Yes. Chair. Yeah. And and would you be okay with if we did eliminate the the sections that were eliminated before, or would you prefer that we keep them in? Obviously, you put them back in for this session. So just kind of curious on your thoughts on that. Um. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I uh, I didn't e even know that there were sections put in this that were uh, apologize for that, but uh, the committee amendment was the bill that was supposed to be printed. So, thank you, uh, Chairman Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Falkenham, for your. Um, your introduction. Welcome to, to the committee. Um, quick quick question. I noticed on on page one um, under section two line twenty nine uh, subsection D there it says a statement that the candidate has not been enrolled in a party qualified to participate in a primary or general election after March first of the election year. Can you, and and I apologize. You probably you probably explained this the last time around. Can you help me understand the the why that's in there and what the purpose of that is? Uh, what, where, where are you at on the, the page one, page one, section two. You're, he's muted. You've got yourself muted or somebody has you muted. No, that's on me, my apologies. Okay. Um, I'm trying to switch screens. That's why I got it on the other screen here. Um, it's subsection two, page one, section two, subsection D, uh, which if you look on the left-hand side, it's line number 29. Okay. You find it? Yep. Okay. A statement that the candidate has not been enrolled in. Oh, okay, so I think I think what these sections are is just sections that are already there, and they're getting put back back in with the new language. I this is nothing. Um, doesn't seem like anything that pertains to this bill in particular. I think it's just the section, and uh, I think the reason uh, I think the reason why that is in there is uh, because. I think this has to do with people running as uh, independents on the ballot and the deadline that they they have to be unenrolled. I, I, I'm not sure about that. 
Um, I, I wasn't able to see that in the original, but it, I could be wrong. So um, if it's not, if it's not something that was in the original bill uh, that's being, that's being presented new, uh, is that your intent to try and uh, to relate it to the independence? Uh, no, that, that, sec that really has nothing that pertains to the, to the bill as, okay. as far as I'm coming from, as far, as far as I know, this is, uh, everything that's already standardized in that election law. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Yep. So Representative Tuttle. Representative Falkingham, uh, do you know of any other states that allow this to occur on their ballots? Uh, yeah, actually a lot of, a lot of other states uh, allow some form of this. I, Wish I had the article in front of me, but um, <clears throat> if you if you uh, actually one of the news newspapers in Maine did an article on it, and they mentioned how other states uh, allow that. Um, I I believe there's there's quite a few that uh, allow some 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 variation of it, uh, but there's also some some other examples of it are. Um, when Mitt Romney ran for president, he ran as Mitt Romney, which is a nickname for mittens that he got when he was a, a child. And his legal name is Willard Romney. So there's there's an example there. Um, and then uh, Shelly Pingree, she went the other route and actually had her, her name legally changed. So there's someone that was uh, Rochelle and legally changed her name to Shelly that she was known by. So, um, you know, obviously she didn't have anything that, you know, hindered her from doing that, or she thought it was more valuable to ha have that name. Um, but, you know, like I spelled out, there's reasons why people wouldn't, wouldn't want to legally change their name. So um, that's why I'm introducing this bill. So, so to give another option. Well, for the work session, Mr. Chair, I'd like to maybe have our folks clarify that so we could discuss that. Uh, 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 I would like to have that done representing Falkenham. Would you agree? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah, I would, I would, I would throw out some guesses on what, what are the other states, but um, off the top of my head, I don't remember. So it, it's just better to have your uh, research done, but it's, it's quite a, quite a significant number of states. We'll see if we can find information on that for the work session. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Representative yeah, Wood. The other thing I, I, I want to add while, while that question is there is um, that this bill would keep keep intact that legal that legal name on the ballot. It's just that it would uh, allow the nickname to be in there so that it so it would still say W R, which is my initials. So it would have my legal initials and my and my last name it would say wr but then it would uh put in the name that i'm that i'm known by no as far as cost there must have been some discussion of that last session uh yeah this bit this bill actually had no fiscal note on it it doesn't it it wouldn't uh it wouldn't cost the secretary of state any more money to to do this bill so there's no no cost associated to it. Thank okay, you. Representative, Representative Wood. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, um, you've actually, I think, answered my, my first question uh, when you spoke about Mitt Romney, because I thought I remembered way back, Sean, my age, that Jimmy Carter actually uh, made an issue of the fact that he wanted to be on the ballot as Jimmy and not James. And I, I think, I didn't know if you knew if that had actually gone through. That was my, my recollection um, on Jimmy Carter. So that's another possible we can, example. Yeah, we can check with Secretary of State too on that. Yeah, yeah. sorry. And uh, I also think there's a difference between uh, federal, federal laws and, and state laws too. Right. But if we can do it for the president, I, I just wonder 
what can we do at the state level? Yeah, um, yeah, and you'll probably see, you'll probably get testimony from a lot of other people. It's it's just a matter of transparency, the the issues that have been brought up about the the crazy names and, and that stuff seem, they really seem to be non-issues to me. And like like I said, if if someone really wanted to play games like that, there's already a, there's a, there's a foolproof method that they could do to, to, to get that on the ballot. With the other question that I had was actually if we could get somebody maybe from the secretary of state's office, um, cause I believe they do some kind of vetting on vanity license plates to prevent offensive things being put on vanity plates. And so if we could just take a look at what's their process and would any of that apply here if somebody was trying to put forward a nickname that some might consider offensive. Right, and Representative, I believe we have uh, uh, someone from Secretary of State's office in the list who okay. to testify as well, yep. That's all, thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just have two kind of quick questions. So number one, how are you listed on your official legislative stationery and in the legislature's registry, the little book we get, or even on the, the website under your member name? Yeah. So all my, all my letterhead says Billy Bob Falkenham, representative Billy Bob Falkenham, uh, my stamps say Representative Billy Bob Falkenham. My uh, um, every everything I get from the legislature says Billy Bob Falkenham. My my name up on the like uh, I don't know what it's called, but I call it the score scoreboard. The, the green and red lights says uh, BBF Falkenham. Uh, the name on my desk says Billy Bob Falkenham. Uh, all my campaign material says Billy Bob Falkenham. I signed my checks, Billy Bob Falkenham. So uh, there's not not much out there that doesn't doesn't say Billy Bob Falkenham other other than my birth certificate. So so then the other piece is that you know I I recall that that whenever I've run for office, I've had to you know turn in a piece of paper to the Secretary of State. Um, saying how I prefer to, to be listed sort of in, in all the materials, you know, and I'm guessing instead of going by Patrick, I could go by Pat, Patty. I don't want to go by Patty, you know, or, or anything else, so long as it's probably a derivative of, of Patrick. Um, did they kind of have an explanation for this? Like, I know that I technically don't have to go by Patrick if I prefer to be called Pat. Which I never would. I hate that. But yeah, as far as I can tell, the only uh, the only issue holding this up is the statute that says that right now says it has to be your birth birth certificate name, uh, and that's why we're allowed to use the name that we're we're known as on everything else, even uh, even on uh, your ethics page. Um, I was able to put. William Billy Bob Falkenham uh, on my ethics report. So uh, I would. That's it. It's the only thing. I would actually it. love to know how many legislators don't actually. I'd, I'd personally love to know how many legislators don't actually go by their um, given given name on on a birth certificate. You know, not not necessarily a nickname, but what their you know shortened you know name is and and everything else you know i imagine that you know barb wood sitting on this community committee is probably barbara and i'm not sure if jay mccrate has has a shorter one but maybe she could let us know if she's got a longer thing to jay so it'd be interesting to know chris could be christopher i don't know for sure but um it'd be interesting to know this yeah it's, Thank you. it's quite a few it's more than more than you'd realize and some of them uh you know some of them like Chris and Christopher are simple, you know, simple ones are Dave, Dave for David. Um, but then there's other, other ones like, uh, and I'm not sure if he's here to testify today or not, but uh, Jack Ducharme 
it is his name his name is John Ducharme and he actually you've got some testimony there you'll read or maybe he'll come and tell you the story yep. himself but um is he is he on the list yep. Louis? Yep. He's, he's gonna testify. Okay, well I'll let him tell it himself. <laughs> <laughs> um uh there's uh Jim Thorne, you know, Trey Stewart. There's there's a lot of them out there. Uh actually Brad, Brad Farron. There's another one. Um so you know, I see Barb Wood over here. I so I mean th there's a lot of them and uh actually the way it's uh the way the law works now is, is some people can actually get away with it but you know and and shorten it up uh but but i can't you know mine's mine's not acceptable so i'd like to have that changed and and like i said it's not it's not about it's not just about me it's about everybody it's about transparency this is um you know and there's not there's very few bills out there uh, usually a bill le leans right or leans left. There's not a lot of bills that don't lean any way at all. And this is one of those bills. It doesn't lean any way at all. This is a, this is just a people bill. This is just a transparency bill. We've got uh, representative Joyce McCrate, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you outed me. <laughs> <laughs> See, I didn't even know that. <laughs> you didn't. Well, now you do. Um, I just wanted to point out that the amendment of the bill from the 129th does, does have a sort of fiscal note that if a uh, change like this requires two lines, the Secretary of State would have to um, expend $172,000. Um, so just wanted to mention that. Thanks. Great. Um, Representative Dolliff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I co-sponsored this bill. We had it last session. A lot of um, talk and good conversation about it. But that's when I learned Jay was not Jay McRae, too. It was last session that she did have a different name. I think this is a straightforward bill. Um, Yes, it was a fiscal note if they couldn't get enough in the line that it would possibly make an extra page. So until we figure out how much space can be taken, and to me, even if it does take an extra line, I think straightforward, it will be worth it because there's a lot of people, a lot right here in this group that don't go by their full legal name. And I applaud you, Billy Bob, for bringing it up again. Thank you. Um, I also have, I know that wasn't a question, but I sort of yeah. have a, a, an answer to that or, or a little to add to that. Um, there are, the length of someone's name shouldn't, impede or shouldn't make a decision on whether that's going to cost more money there are there are some extremely long names and there are some extremely short names and in some cases the nickname is going to make make it shorter on the ballot like mine for example billy bob is a lot shorter than william robert um there are some legal names that are extremely long and if those people want their legal names printed the Secretary of State has no recourse. They can't deny that, you know. Um, I and I used the example before, you know. There's uh, because it's a good example. Muslim names. There are some Muslim names that are very long. If someone wanted to put that name on the ballot, then uh, there'd be there'd be no recourse to that. So I I I just don't think that's a good, uh, you know hindrance or, or a night it's not not even necessarily a, a negative to this issue i think that's just an issue that's an issue with any name not not just nicknames so that that would be my comment to that great any further questions seeing none thank you representative Falkingham, for your testimony and for bringing in the bill
Thanks a lot. Have a good morning. Thank you. Well, I've, I've got to correct it. There was an issue up at City Hall. Okay. Um, so next, uh, let's see. Okay, we've got a couple of co-sponsors who will be joining in, I believe, on this bill. So we've got Representative Ducharme. And uh, so once they, they pop up, we can see if they're ready to testify or wanting to testify. And we also have Representative Thorne. And I think we had Representative Carmichael, but it looks like he may have left. Um, so Representative Ducharme, if you're ready, welcome. There, I had to do the mute thing. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I am Representative Jack Ducharme, uh, or also Representative John Ducharme, as the case may be. Um, Senator Lucchini, Representative Piazzo, members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. My name is John Jack Ducharme. I represent House District 111, Nord Solon, and most of Madison. LD-109 is important to me because of my own personal experience with using my nickname. My real name is John E. Ducharme III. And I suspect that Senator Farron, who I've known for at least 10 years, doesn't even know that. <laughs> Regardless, I moved to the town of Madison in 1982 as an adult with my wife and young family. My kids were enrolled in Madison schools and ultimately graduated from Madison schools in 2002 and 2003. During the time that my boys were growing up, I was active in both school life, serving on MSAD 59 school board from 99 to 2005. I was a youth t-ball, baseball, football coach uh, for the recreation committee from 88 to 1996 when the boys started playing sports in the school system. I was active in the school boosters groups and in local business organizations. In 2008, there was a, an opening on the Madison Board of Select. Since my boys were gone by then, I decided to run for the board. I ran a good campaign. I knocked on doors, put out about 50 signs, um, asking folks to elect Jack Duchon, and did all the things that one needs to do to win uh, in a local campaign. On election day, I was at the town office greeting voters and, as appropriate and allowed by campaign law. I lost by 11 votes. Election night, I had several couples come out of the polls and come up to me asking why my name wasn't on the ballot. I told them it was, but they said, we looked for Jack Ducharme, but there was no Jack Ducharme on the ballot. Through the entire process, it never occurred to me that everyone in town knew me as Jack Ducharme. Very few knew that my real name was John. Since that election, I've been very careful to make sure my real name is on campaign signs to avoid such a problem. I won three races for selectmen, won my current seat as representative for Maine House District 111. Many people use nicknames, and while some have nicknames that only a select few know, many are known only by their nicknames. The current law requires legal given name on the ballot. If a person can verify by either a piece of mail or some other independent source that they're known by a nickname, they should be allowed to put their nickname on the ballot to avoid the situation that happened to me in 2008. Thank you for considering this bill. Thank you, Representative Ducharme. Uh, any questions from the committee? Uh, Senator Farron. Senator Farron, unfortunately you're muted, sir. There we go, get that technology piece. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, Representative Sharm, uh, for bringing this forward. And just wanted to clarify one thing about uh, uh, me not knowing Jack and John. It was because uh, when you came to town in 1982, I was still in high school. So just, yeah, you know, that's what, <laughs> different circles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, Senator Farron. Any other questions for Representative Ducharme? All right, seeing none, thank you. Uh, representative for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, we can move on to Representative Thorne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, members of the Veteran Legal Affairs Committee. 
My name is Representative Jim Thorne. I'm out of District 103, Carmel, uh, Roger Reed's former seat. And I am here to testify on behalf of this piece of legislation, uh, LD 109. Uh, my given name is James. Uh, very few people call me James. My parents are deceased, God rest their souls. And my mother was one that always called me James whenever I did something she didn't agree with. Other than that, um, I hold before you, uh, I don't know if it's displaying backwards or not, but uh, that's my campaign card that does say Jim Thorne on it, 2020. And this is a, a palm card that I had made up also for last year that does say Jim Thorne on it. Uh, my lawn signs, red and white, and they displayed Jim Thorne. And the only place that I could not display Jim Thorne on was the ballot. And not because I didn't ask. I, I tried and I pleaded and I asked nicely twice and was told that the only name I could put on that was my given legal name. So, um, it would be nice to have the name that I go by again, uh, pretty much representative Wood covered it with Jimmy Carter. Uh, most folks know me by Jim and that's just the way it is. Um, I don't want to take up a lot of the committee's time and I know most of my point had been addressed previously and uh, I just wanted to go on record as, as being for it and for a very simple reason is that Everyone knows me by Jim Thorne versus James Thorne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Great, and I believe that's it for um, co-sponsors who are here. Oh, actually we may have uh, I believe we have Representative Carmichael here. So just take a moment. Welcome, uh, Representative Carmichael. Uh, you've got the floor. <laughs> Good morning. Morning, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee. Um, I'm coming to testify in, on behalf of this LD 109. Uh, my given name is Melvin Carmichael, which had to appear on a ballot, but um, other than my mother and uh, a very few other people, uh, no one ever used it. I've always been known as Mickey Carmichael. Um, I've been self-employed for 35 years and I, I've come to know a lot of people as Mickey Carmichael and very few people uh, have ever known me by my given name. Uh, I have a brother that's just a couple years older than me that's in the same, actually the same kind of business that I am. So uh, when I decided to run for the legislature and, and actually in other circumstances as well, you know, it's, um, he has, uh, has caused a lot of confusion with the public. And I think that that confusion could be eliminated pretty simply if we could just put that uh, nickname in there and uh, you know everybody would know exactly who they're voting for. And uh, it would just you know, do, a lot with a do away with a lot of confusion, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony today. Okay, next up, we're gonna uh, go to public testimony. And again, we'll remind that we use a three minute clock. So if you can tailor your marks to three minutes, um, that would be appreciated. Uh, we're gonna go based on uh, people who signed up. And I believe we've, we've got to switch out. So we're gonna begin with Bob Howe uh, testifying 
for the Maine Citizens for Clean Election League of Women Voters. Uh, then we'll go to Quinn Gormley, who I believe is also in support of this bill. So we'll take a minute to, to bring people up. And we'll begin with uh, Bob Howe whenever you're ready. All right, I think Welcome. I'm finally. Welcome. I think I'm finally ready. Good morning. Well, thank you. Just good some wood. Uh, well, it's been up there for about a week. That's my yeah. uh, maple sugar shack. I'm ready for the sap to start running. Nice. I'm Bob Howe. I'm a resident of Brunswick, and uh, I'm here today to speak on behalf of the uh, League of Women Voters. But first, um, with respect to the photograph on Senator Farron's wall, which was discussed earlier. I was in the Air Force so long ago that uh, they were still using the predecessor to that aircraft, the KC-97. Uh, thank you. Well Bob, well, Bob, you could say the same thing about you and I in the legislature. Well, I didn't want to out you how old you are, but John and I served together in the late 70s and early 80s in the House. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I am not Anna Keller. Um, I am pinch hitting for Anna, who had a, a, another commitment at 11 o'clock. I'm speaking on behalf of the League of Women Voters in support of LD 109. Um, the League is a nonpartisan political organizations that have been working for over 100 years to encourage informed and active participation in government, to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. We never support or oppose any political party or candidate. The League's support of this bill rests in the public interest that it serves. We believe voters benefit when there is clarity about who's who on their ballot. If a candidate is known by a name other than their legal name, LD 109 allows that name to appear on the ballot. The bill requires the candidate to declare to the Secretary of State that the nickname is the name by which they are known. It also requires Secretary of State to place that nickname in quotation marks with their legal last name and first and middle initials or names. We believe those two provisions are adequate to ensure that the law will be used as intended and not for any nefarious purposes. Voters will be aware that the candidate is not using their legal name. Candidates may use their usual name in their campaign without the additional burden of explaining to supportive voters why they must choose an unfamiliar name in order to vote for them. The only suggestion we have is to change the word nickname to a familiar name in the title and the bill. Nickname implies a term of endearment, affection, or description. And in fact, there are many reasons why people go by a name other than their legal name. We don't see a public interest in limiting the reach of this bill to the narrow interpretation that nickname could imply. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Howe. Um, any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Okay, next up we have Quinn Gormley. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Lucini and Representative Chiazzo. My name is Quinn Gormley. I'm a resident of Auburn, and I'm here today in my capacity as Executive Director of the Maine Transgender Network, and I'm testifying in favor of LD 109. Maine Transnet is Maine's sole organization specifically dedicated to supporting transgender Mainers. For 16 years, we've worked to create safe and affirming community spaces for trans people and those who love them across our state. We seek to create a Maine where transgender people are able to fully participate in public life. Serving in public office is an essential measure of any community's ability to participate in public life, and transgender people have made great strides on this front in recent years. This past September, Maine elected our first openly transgender public official, official Geo Neptune, to the board of the Indian Township School District. In coming years, we're hopeful Maine will join New Hampshire, Vermont, Virginia, Colorado, and Delaware in electing and seating our first openly trans legislators. LD109 will address one key barrier to increasing trans representation in elected office. Many trans people are known by names other than our legal names. 
Although many of us choose to align our chosen and legal names through a legal name change process, there are a number of reasons a trans person may not have completed this process, including cost and the fear of being outed. LD109 would create a path for trans people to be listed on the ballot by the name most of their peers know them and identify them by, while also protecting them from the indignity of having a previous name that does not reflect who they currently are printed on a government document. We join our colleagues from the League of Women Voters and recommended the committee consider changing the term nickname to a familiar name, as this more accurately captures the full breadth of reasons a potential candidate might, uh, for office might seek to use this option. Thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions the committee may have. Great, thank you for your testimony. Any questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Kinney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I probably should have asked this earlier too. I thought of it kind of after the fact, but um, the amendment suggestion of uh, changing nickname to familiar name, would it work if we used both? Because some people might consider the nickname idea versus the familiar idea. Would that be acceptable? That's acceptable on our end, yeah. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony, Quinn. So next up on our list, uh, we have, we'll bring up Hetty Du Bois and then Julie Flynn. And if there's any other um, people in the attendee group who wishes to speak on this bill, I don't believe anybody else has signed up for this one, but if you do wish you can uh, for today, you can use the raise your hand function and we'll, we'll see you that way, so. Great. So we'll turn it over to Patty Du Bois. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Lucchini and uh, Representative Chiazzo and members of the Veteran and Legal Affairs Committee. I'm not sure that it matters, but um, I'm speaking either for or against. So I'm happy to defer to later if you would prefer. You can go now, that's fine. Yeah. Um, really, I don't have a lot to add other than uh, what we've written testimony from the Maine Towns and City Clerks Association that uh, we would ask that you consider amending the bill to prohibit use of a nickname that could be deemed as offensive or obscene or vulgar, uh, even if it is the known name of a person, uh, which could in fact be the case. Um, so that's the only... Um, proposed amendment that we would offer and we're happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, Representative Kinney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Dubois. Du Dubois or Dubois? I remember. Dubois. Dubois, yes. I'm, I'm French, so I understand both ways of saying that. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I asked the question to Representative Fockingham about the vulgarity and of course he made the comment that people could technically legally change their name to something that is vulgar and it, there wouldn't really be any recourse we would have. Um, <coughs> so how would you recommend we try to put something like that in? Because that was something I did read the testimony and it and it did strike me. I, I, I kind of appreciate that information and I do worry too a little bit because I've seen vulgar license plates so I'm not a hundred percent sure that there is a, a that might be something that uh, Julie Flynn will be able to answer a little bit in, in a few minutes but what do you have suggestions on how we could put that into language I wish I did uh, I think it's probably unlikely that someone go would go to the extreme of having a legal name change for a, to use a vulgar name as their legal name, uh, although it's unlikely, it's not out of out of the question that it could happen. Um, I think it's uh, probably more likely that someone would, um, you know, trying to be flip or whatever to be on a local ballot, perhaps uh, that they would be more inclined to to use something like that. Um, so I, I wish I did have a good answer for that, but I, I really don't. If they're willing to go to the time and expense of doing a legal name change, then that it is what it is. Thanks. Uh, Representative Corey. We've, we've got you on mute, Representative. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
when the bill sponsor was talking about the bill earlier, the person would have to sign like a legal, you know, affidavit. Do you know what I mean? Basically saying, you know, that that's their name. That's what, what people, people call them. So in, in, in my eyes, you know, even though going through a whole name change, you know, with the probate court is one thing, this person is still saying that that's their, their their name so you know i imagine that you know signing a legal affidavit you know would be under the the penalty of law you know possibly our analysts can tell us what the penalty would be for signing an affidavit you know that's false um but would a legal affidavit would would that sort of affidavit be enough for you to to print the name um if you're asking me yes it would um, but I would say that there are some people that, in fact, have those types of nicknames legitimately that wouldn't be um, falsifying anything by declaring that. But the question is, is that something that we would want printed on a ballot if it is really offensive? I'm just going to say I haven't met one of these people. I'm really curious as to <laughs> what they're calling themselves. <laughs> You can private message me and I'll share my experience with a couple of people that I've known since high school. <laughs> maybe, maybe Julie will share when she testifies. Right. She probably has more than I do. So I'll defer to Julie Flynn on that. <laughs> uh, Representative McCray. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, this maybe is a question for the work session if we don't hear from someone else referring to it. I did some research on license plates because of a constituent concern and because of um, free speech, they have not been able or chosen not to limit license plates. So I think the same issue would be here and perhaps we could hear more about that if we don't in the public hearing. Thanks. Chairman Chiazzo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I, I'm kind of aligned with Representative McCrate. I guess my question would be, that's just kind of a subjective measurement. And I'm wondering if um, you're proposing a list of prohibited words, or if you're, if you're intending to have that be under the realm of the Secretary of State, or how do you foresee enforcement of that? Um, I would envision it to be somewhat subjective. I don't know that we could ever come up with a a completely comprehensive list of what may be considered offensive, uh, which may be different, different people, obviously. Um, but I think the, the responsibility would fall for the state ballots on the Secretary of State's office and for municipal ballots on the municipal clerk for those you know, subjective decisions. Uh, Senator Farron. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, just to let the committee members know that uh, at serving on transportation as well. We've got three bills that I'm aware of dealing with this very issue. Um, an act to, to create appropriate standards for the Secretary of State to follow and approve the assignments of vanity registration plates by Senator Diamond. We got an act to allow the Secretary of State to refuse to recall of vanity registration plates from Senator Guerin. And we got an act to authorize the Secretary of State to reject certain vanity plates from Senator Rosen. So we got three of those bills coming forward in transportation that uh, are, are looking at those items. Great, thanks for that. Um, any other questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you, Patty, for your testimony. Thank you. Yeah. So next on the list, we have Deputy Secretary of State, Julie Flynn. Welcome. Good, mor <clears throat> Good morning, um, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and members of the committee. I am Julie Flynn, the Deputy Secretary of State for the Bureau of Corporations, Elections, and Commissions, and I am speaking in opposition uh, to the legislation today uh, for similar reasons as we did uh, two years ago, although I do want to point out some of the differences uh, between that bill and this bill. And certainly the decision of what is fair ballot representation is a policy question that does belong to the legislature. And the past legislatures have determined that fair ballot representation means putting the legal name of the candidate on the ballot. Um, I do wanna clarify the full legal name does not have to go on the ballot. So if you are a person that has 
uses two middle names. Uh, you don't have to put all of those. It has to be in one of the forms that the law allows, which is first initial, full middle name, um, and last name, uh, last name and first name, last name, uh, first name, last name, first name, middle name. Um, and we do have a, a space issue currently uh, with some names. There are some surnames that are longer, uh, particularly certain uh, ethnicities have, have longer names. And um, but there is limited space on paper ballots. If we're talking about an electronic ballot, which Maine doesn't use uh, for most of the voters, uh, there is some uh, room on a screen to, to have something fit, you know, all on one line or they're showing one candidate at a time. Uh, but the first issue is how to make a ballot uniform and consistent and not give weight to any one candidate over another, because if you have a candidate uh, with a lengthy name and it has to, what we call wrapped two lines, so it has to be partly printed on one line and then on another line. If it's a primary election, there's not generally an issue because many of you are running unopposed and many of the offices have a single candidate. So you're not giving the candidate with two names, two lines for their name any weight over another candidate. What we do with the general election is if someone had wanted to use their full legal name with, you know, last name, full first name, full middle names, and maybe two middle names, we would have to discuss uh, how to do that. Uh, the other issue is really the issue of what's obscene or vulgar and, and whether that creates a problem. I would suggest uh, that if you're going to amend this to say, you know, to define what you mean by uh, middle name, uh, you know, pet name, nickname, shortened name, familiar name, if you're going to use a term to actually put a de definition. And I think I'm happy to answer any questions at this point. Great. Thank you, Deputy Flynn. Uh, Representative Tuttle. Secretary Flynn, I had asked this question earlier about what other states allow this to go in effect. I know that Representative Falkingham said there were a number of them. Could you clarify that? Uh, Representative Tuttle, we, we have not had the occasion to do that research and I'm sure that that's something that could be done for the committee, um, you know, through NCSL, but. Yeah. Well, if you could work with our staff, Julie, and getting so, that for the public hearing, at least from my perspective, it would be something I'd like to look at, and there's also a mention of cost that I know myself and uh, Representative McCrate uh, had asked questions on. So, could you clarify that? Um, certainly. I the issue really is if if you have to have all the names on a particular ballot go onto two lines because you have one name that requires two lines. Um, in order for uniformity, you have to give everybody a sec another line to their name. It does push things down so that, they, you know, the, the ballot has limitations in width. It's eight and a half wide. That's as wide as you can go. And those columns are only a certain number of characters wide. In length, you, you can have multiple lengths, but longer ballots um, have additional costs. If you can't fit it on one ballot, you have to go to a second ballot page, not just front and back of a ballot, but now you have to have another ballot page. That's where uh, the 172,000 came in, I think was our fiscal note for doing a separate uh, ballot, you know, a second ballot page by itself. Um, I will say that this bill, as opposed to two years ago, only requires the first and middle initial with the surname and then the nickname in quotes. So it may limit that, uh, but I will tell you the other issue that we, um, because our ballot is a three column wide ballot and because we have ovals to the right of the name in order to accommodate and be the same as the rank choice grid, we do not generally use the middle column of the ballot 
because then you have a butterfly ballot. If people remember back to um, the, 20, the 20,000 election where um, people were confused because the ovals to the right of the name were right next to the name in the left, the next column over and people were marking incorrectly because they couldn't tell which oval was for which candidate. So we have been able to use um, the two outer columns of the ballot to list the offices and the names. And if we have to use that middle column rather than go to a ballot, a third ballot, we do risk that butterfly effect, which would be a problem. Well, thank you, Secretary Flynn for your response and answer. Thank you. Thanks, and we'll reach out uh, to NCSL and see if we can get that information too, Representative. Uh, Representative Kinney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've actually already reached out to my caucus's uh, policy director to try to get some of that information as well, Representative Tuttle. Um, but my, my question uh, for the de Deputy Secretary, um, you mentioned the, the cost with possibly a longer name and you did address the fact that our uh, the sponsor has said put a, initials and then um, and in his case for example William Robert is longer than Billy Bob but there are we even have some members of our uh, house and senate that have two last names and that is their legal name I know for myself I never took I did I dropped my maiden name when I got married but a lot of women do not and I know several men in my lifetime that have hyphenated last names, which are going to be longer than if they only use one last name. So to me, this the idea of being opposed to this because the name will be longer, make the ballot longer, just doesn't seem to hold enough water for me. I, I'm just wondering um, why this would end up being an issue. Well, as I, I tried to say in the beginning, um, you're not required to use the full middle name. So for someone that has a hyphenated last name or a particularly long last name, I would say Falkingham is certainly a longer name than Flynn. Um, so we would negotiate if it were going to create a, an issue of going to the ballot, we'd talk to the, the candidate and say, you know, we're gonna need to, either we're gonna have to print another ballot or, can we just use your first name instead of using William Robert it, and have them agree? And we have had success in doing that with, with many candidates where that has come up. So if they had a particularly long last name and they wanted to put a first and a full middle name and it wouldn't all fit, we have talked to them and they've dropped the middle initial or the middle name uh, in favor of, of just being able to fit on a, on a line. But I think for fairness, we, we have to be careful about not giving weight to one candidate over another when you are running opposed and there's several candidates for an office. And that's why we would not wrap one name and not do that for the other names. And then you do that for a whole ballot because of a, a name, you have to do that ballot style as a completely, it's a, a, you'd have to set it up completely separately. It's, it, it is, you know, it, it, it can end up being more costly if you have to if you have to go to another ballot. It's just the, the fact of the system that we use is there's limits and there are limits to all systems in terms of the width and, and the length. So may I follow up, Mr. Chair? Yeah, go for it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so you currently do follow up or negotiate with people with long names as it is. So why couldn't there be some negotiation with nicknames? Well, I guess the, the point is we're, we're asking them to do something that is putting their name in another allowable form. So um, whereas they don't have to agree, but the, 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 you know, the counter to that is we're going to have a, a ballot that's too long and we're gonna have to print a second ballot. You know, I think that in many cases, you know, they might agree or may not agree. The point is I cannot, we cannot enforce that. We can only go with what the law says. We, you know, it's another form that's allowable, whereas, you know, currently the, the nickname or familiar name uh, is not. 
Uh, Representative Dolov. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, Deputy Director. Nice to, nice to see you. I just have a quick question. The font size, is that legally a certain size? Can we go down a size? So, is, but is the font specific? The font is not specified in the law. We, we've done a lot of ballot layout. Um, the Arial font is what's called a true type font. So it creates even spacing. So every name is equally easy to read. There are other fonts that would squeeze it in. So if the name, um, in order to fit Falkingham William Robert in, it might squeeze it down so the letters were closer together and not as easy to read. That's one reason why um, there are standards for ballot design, not in our law, but we endeavor to follow. Um, and that is one of them. So the Arial is something that is a font that evenly spaces out the name and, and makes the characters of, of equal weight. Um, the size, we don't, we sometimes have uh, used a, a larger font for the candidate names. That's the minimum size that we would use to still have it be readable and then have the information below be a little smaller font so that the name has more weight than the municipality or, or the party that's on another line. Um, but that's a choice from, from that, you know, good ballot design to try to have certain things uh, stand out. You know, the, the, um, the office title being shaded, none of that's in law. We wouldn't want it in law because that hampers your ability to design a ballot that's uniform and doesn't you know, favor any, any particular office or candidate any more than any other. Can I have a follow-up, Mr. Chair? Yep. Um, when I, I'm, I know there's different characters and some can be squeezed closer, but I'm thinking of the idea as if we use a, say a 14 font, 14 point font on a ballot, if we went down to a 12 or if we use a 12 and we went down to a 10 or even 11, that one font down may give us more room on the ballot. We are. So we're not by any law saying we have to use say 14 font no, or 12. No. no, but we are, for candidate names now, we are currently using a 10 point font and using an eight point font for the party and the municipality of residence, which is on the line below the name. So if we go down to an eight point font and the candidates names, you know, Small. we're going to have some issues with legibility. Uh, we would not go below an eight point font for, for anything on a ballot. It's just, it's not- It's too very small. Readable. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Representative Corey. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So thank you for being here, Deputy Flynn. Um, I've got two questions. I'm a, I'm a typophile, so I'm not gonna get into any of, of those previous questions about font size and everything else. Just for everybody's reference, a true type font's actually a type of a font like versus a postscript font. And it's how they communicate with computers and computer systems. It doesn't have anything to do with the space between um, letters and everything, but I'll move on. Um, so I, I found sort of this this concept of of weight or a person's you know name weight sort of really interesting. You know, it, it seems like the way it's being approached right now, it's kind of based on how much advertising space I guess is being bought on the ballot by the length of somebody's name versus um, whether or not any any weight is given to um, whether or not somebody is actually known, you know, in their, their community versus another candidate. So has, has any thought been given to if somebody is out there and they have to run with a name that they're not known by, that that, that has another type of weight on whether or not they'll be elected or not? Um, I think the choice of this language was uh, 
prior legislatures. So I don't know what mm -hmm. the history is, uh, you know, why mm -hmm. the discussion was that, that it would be the legal name. Um, you know, so that's not, I, I mean, obviously we're not weighing in on the policy choice. We're mm -hmm. just giving you some examples of administrative issues that we will encounter in, in producing a ballot. And I, so. Did the legislature weigh in? Do you know if the legislature weighed in on whether there was one line or two lines back then and how that may disproportionately give one candidate weight over another candidate? I think that was um, that was back, uh, you know, certainly before my time that it's been yeah. you know, the names in this format. I've been here 26 years, yeah. but um, I think we are charged with, you know, the, there is another place where the ballot ballot has to be as uniform as possible. And so we're trying to have every office be the same size, every candidate's name. And we certainly would not want to use an eight point font on one candidate's name and use a 10 point or 12 point font on your opponent's name. I mean, that's not, doesn't have to be put in law for us to understand our responsibility to lay out a ballot that the, the, the layout does not leave somebody, uh, draw somebody's eye to a particular, a particular candidate over any other. And if you have one candidate that has an extra line and none of the other candidates for that office have an extra line, I think it is gonna draw your attention to it. And that's been our, you know, in our calculus in laying out a ballot. And we are working with a system that yeah. It's not a drag and drop, or you can just you know move things here and there. Everything is so many millimeters away from something else. It's very precise and it has some limits to it. And we're, that's just a fact of you know the systems that are there for ballot. You know, for this, you have to have a ballot that is capable of being scanned and read by the the tabulators that we're using, and that's the the ballot design system that we're using. So. Sure, I, I completely understand that. And, yeah. and, and Julie, you'll be here for the work session, right? If we yeah. want to delve more into fonts and stuff. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, if I could, I just wanted to answer one of the questions that someone had asked about, you know, why uh, it talks about the, the statement that the candidate has not been enrolled after March 1st. Um, those are requirements in the current consent that a candidate has to sign. If you're a party candidate, you have to say you haven't changed parties after uh, January 1st. If you're a non-party candidate, you say that you have not, you know, enrolled in a party, you know, after after March 1st. So those are in the requirements for the current candidate consent. And so this new nickname or familiar name, however it ends up, is just simply adding a different aspect to what's already there. So it's it's now been reorganized into more of a list form instead of a paragraph form, but those requirements were already in current law. So just real quick, my, my second question there was that with regard to what name we put on that slip um, of paper when we asked, were asked how we want to be referred to, you know, as a candidate and everything, I'll give you a really great example. So, uh, you know, outside of me being Pat or Patrick, and I, I label Patrick because that's what it says on my birth certificate, but my grandfather, his name was Stanislaus Zibira, right? He was Polish. And if he put on, you know, your form, Stanley Zibira, which is what he actually went by, you don't check birth certificates. How would you actually know that his real name was Stanislaus versus Stanley? Um. I wouldn't necessarily, that might not trigger my attention, but we've certainly checked on uh, with candidates and asked whether that is their, their name if they put something that is, appears to be a shortened form of a name. So if they put Stan, we would have asked. Um, and the current law does allow you, you can get a legal name change, but you could also provide us the documentation that you have used that name consistently in other, for other legal purposes in the last two years. So we have asked candidates for that and they have provided other legal 
documents or, or um, purposes for which they have used that name and we have accepted that name. But that's what's in so the let me get this. So let me get this right. So like for Billy Bob Fockingham, if all of his legislative sessionary says Billy Bob, if on the legislature's registry, it says Billy Bob, if his checks say Billy Bob and everything else, he can go by Billy Bob Fockingham? No, the language is pretty specific. It's in uh, Title 21A, Section 601, Subsection 2, Paragraph B1. And it's the name consistently used by the candidate during the past two years in filings with government agencies and in the transaction of public business. And it, it lists some things, but it's not limited to voter registration, motor vehicle registration, driver license, passport, professional licenses, local state or federal permits of any kind, public benefit programs, veterans benefits and social security. So, Thanks. Yeah, and I think Janet can provide us with that uh, for the work session too, so that people can get a copy of the statute, statutory language on that. Thanks for pointing that out. You good, Representative Corey? Okay. Yep. Uh, Representative Kinney. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, <sighs> I, I'm kind of going back to the idea of not wanting to give preferential treatment or, or favor to one candidate over another. And I do come back to Representative Falkingham's testimony where someone he knew very well said, yeah, I voted for that Falkingham person, that William, do you know him? And he turns around and says, well, yeah, that's me. So to me, it seems that sometimes we're giving preferential treatment by not allowing them their, their nickname or, or familiar name. Um, the same, you know, also Representative Ducharme made, made the same comment that, well, you weren't on the ballot, but he absolutely was. I had an Uncle Jack, so I understand the Jack John um, affiliation, but, you know, um, you know, Richard can be Rich or Dick or something else, and we've certainly got a few of those in, in uh, the legislature now that they don't, aren't necessarily known by their legal name. So now there is actually a preference or a favor given to the person who is known by a different name that's on the ballot. And they're like, oh, well, I don't know who this William Robert is, but, uh, you know, so I'm going to vote for the other person. But they may have wanted to vote for Billy Bob. So that it, it seems that it's some of what you've said is contradictory in, in the idea of not wanting to give favor. So I'm, I, I'm just kind of at odds on this. Your thoughts on, on that comment? I think I, I, I do understand your point, but I think it is the statute that is creating that. It's not the ballot layout. So what, what I was talking about is how you lay out a ballot and not having the, the, the way the, the name is laid out to draw your eye on the ballot. Uh, what the statute says is certainly that's, that's the policy question that you're you have before you to decide. And if that's the way the legislature goes, we'll, we'll have to deal with whatever the administrative consequences are of how we have to lay out the ballot. Great. Uh, great. Well, thank you, Deputy Flynn. Just while I have you here, are you testifying on any other bills today? I'm not. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, seeing no other questions, thank you for being here today, Deputy Secretary Flynn. Okay, next we're gonna, uh, seeing no other people in the attendees list uh, ready to testify, we're gonna close the public hearing on LD109. And next up, we're going to begin the public hearing on LD 157, an act regarding the fair representation of candidate identities. And for that, we have uh, Representative Grohowski. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm just renaming myself here for one moment. <clears throat> uh, good morning. It is still morning. Uh, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. I am Nicole Grahowski, and I represent the communities of Ellsworth and Trenton in the main house. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today in support of LD 157, 
and act regarding the fair representation of candidate identities. Last fall, when I was campaigning door to door, I heard an unusual question from many constituents. No, it wasn't about COVID or healthcare costs, internet education, or our road infrastructure. The question was, who is our current state senator? I heard this inquiry from people who vote regularly and who seemed pretty informed on the issues, but something was confusing them. Two candidates for Maine Senate were broadly advertising their campaigns as re-election campaigns on lawn signs and other materials. Now, I wish I could say this happened because someone was reusing old lawn signs to save money or reduce waste, but these signs were new. Clearly, only one of these two people was the current office holder, while the other was a former senator in the district. The incumbent had served for two years and the former senator for eight, so name recognition in the role was a bit skewed. Using the term reelect when you're not an incumbent is a bit misleading, wouldn't you agree? Now, if the inaccurate representation of a candidate were a problem isolated to this one campaign, I may not have introduced this bill. However, I learned of other misrepresentations of incumbency last fall without even going searching. For example, a photo of a non-incumbent candidate holding a re-election campaign sign was used in a video advertisement produced by a PAC in a Southern Maine district. The photo may have been from a previous campaign in which it was accurate, but the later reuse of this photo was misleading and really a discredit to the candidate. Another concerning incident occurred when a candidate who had never held the office of state representative advertised herself as state representative on materials circulated before the November election. And I hope that if you have my testimony um, available to you via your email system that you can refer to the image that I included at the end of the testimony to see that example. Now with all the problems that face us in the 130th legislature, why should we be concerned with how candidates represent themselves in campaigns? I contend that the trust of the people we serve is at stake and can be eroded over time by misinformation and unethical representation of one's position and incumbency. Recent polling shows that the majority of Americans, 60%, still trust state government while their trust in Congress is at an alarming 33%. I have that citation in my written testimony. It would be extreme, I know, for me to claim that misrepresentations such as these could sow the level of distrust in state government that is occurring at the federal level where dysfunction and gridlock are rampant. However, trust is something that can easily be lost but not easily recovered. As we know well here in the Maine legislature, your word is of top value. Now the legislation before you proposes to define and prohibit false statements of incumbency including the use of the term reelect or the inaccurate use of an office title. For context, immediately prior to this proposed addition in statute is a prohibi prohibition of material false statements as follows, quote, a person that makes a material false statement or that makes a statement that includes a material misrepresentation in a document that is required to be submitted to the commission or that is submitted in response to a request by the commission may be assessed a penalty not to exceed $5,000, end quote. And the commission in question, of course, is the Ethics Commission in this case. This indicates that there are already some limitations in statute regarding false statements in campaign matters. Now, there may be a legal difference between making a false statement in a public report to the Ethics Commission, as opposed to a false statement to the general public. I do not pretend to be a scholar of our Constitution's First Amendment, and of course, I would not encourage the legislature to pass a law that contradicts it. But if as members of this committee, you find these misrepresentations concerning, I hope you will request guidance from the Attorney General's office regarding possible First Amendment limitations, or let me know if this would be helpful for me to request and present at the work session. I do not wish to expose the state to expensive litigation, perhaps reducing the maximum penalty could shield the state from litigation while sending the message to candidates that we expect that they represent themselves accurately to the public. Thank you for your time and consideration of this testimony, and I am happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Dolliff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This actually happened to me my last election where a person that held my seat 
ran again and his signs actually said to reelect and it did confuse people. At first I was upset, but then I put my big girl panties on and I said, okay, he was a legislator once. So I guess you can say he wants to get reelected again. Um, but I can see why this is confusing as people didn't know if who was being actually reelected. The only question I have is, um, the penalty that you put on this, how did you, I think it's very steep to say the least, but um, wondering how you came to that amount. Thanks. Um, that's a great question. And I'm sorry you had a similarly <laughs> confusing uh, experience in your own community. And um, unfortunately, not everyone uh, is able to get the right info. And I definitely cleared this question up for many, many people at their doors, which is what sort of made me concerned. Um, regarding the penalty, I'm um, just looking at the bill. That's an, a maximum penalty. Um, the revisor's office just chose the same penalty as was used in the previous section of statute that I cited um, regarding the uh, material false statements. That also has a maximum penalty of $5,000. But, you know, in assessing that, I think the point is not to, um, you know, try to uh, bankrupt people or make money off of these sort of mistakes, but rather to make it clear that we expect um, accurate communication to the public. So, um, quite frankly, if the penalty were zero, but it was just a reminder to people in the materials from the Ethics Commission, um, because, you know, it's, it's stuff that people just might not think about, frankly. Um, you know, I'm comfortable with that. The penalty is not important to me. What is important is that the public um, understand uh, that if someone is running as the state representative who has never been the state representative, um, that they not think that they're the ones who are confused when really it's the um, candidate who is uh, providing misleading statements, whether intentionally or unintentionally. I have a follow-up, yes. Senator. Yeah. Um, my follow-up to that is, are you talking about candidates that have never held a position in the house or ones that have in the past and they want their seat back and they're seeking re-election too. So the bill um, has two definitions under the false statements of incumbency. The first is using the term re-elect and that would be, uh, I think, I, I would hope that no one who had ever, never held an office would not use the term re-elect. Um, but so that part of the, the legislation, proposed legislation, is um, to limit the use of reelect to only the person who is the current incumbent. But the second part is about the use of the office title. And that does prohibit people who are not um, currently the office holder using that. I, I think there's flexibility there in, in regards to um, certainly we call former governors, governors still, we call former presidents, presidents still. Um, I think there could be a clarification there that it be limited to folks who have never held the office. Um, that was an example that I provided in my testimony that hopefully you can access um, where a candidate for office titled themselves state representative when they had never held that seat. Um, and that happened in this election cycle. I'm aware it has happened in previous election cycles as well. Thank you. Um, and again, just, I think we may, a couple people may have left that were registered to sign up. So if anybody in the attendees wanted to speak, if you can raise your hand, we can call on you. But I think as far as pre-registrations, they may have had to leave because of time. Uh, Representative Corey. Can you hit your, there you go. Yeah, there we go. So I'm thinking about this as somebody that's run a few times now. And um, I, I certainly, you know, like the idea of recycling and reusing, you know, past materials, if I can, especially where I've been a, you know, a clean election candidate, and I don't want to bilk the taxpayers for, you know, more money to run my campaigns, you know, if I don't need to. Um, and my, my first signs that I had out there were hideous, you know, I didn't design them like I would have liked to have, they weren't printed by a nice screen printer they were printed by you know something else they were just junky junky signs so my my signs after that said re-elect because obviously I wanted an advantage in 
in my campaigns. It's sort of another thing that I'm considering right now is that, you know, I'm, I'm personally, I'm terming, I'm terming out, you know, um, can't, people don't necessarily leave the legislature because they lost an election or on their own volition, you know, it's that they could be, you know, terming out themselves. What would you think if we just barred candidates from using the term reelect on their literature or on their signs rather than creating a lot? And we can create like a, a sunset provision for that. You know, we can say that, look, you know, candidates, you know, have the next eight years, do you know what I mean, to amortize and, um, you know, get rid of that old, that old signage. So just what about the idea? idea of just barring candidates from using the term reelect altogether. Um, thank you for the question. And uh, I can appreciate as a, as a fellow font enthusiast, as I heard you were in the last hearing, how one might not like how their signs come out <laughs> and go for a second crack at it. Um, you know, I think, uh, well, it's obviously up to this committee. You are the committee of jurisdiction and expertise in this topic where you might want to take this vehicle that this bill that is now yours um, and mine to help with as you like. Um, I would feel a little bit less comfortable with that and that uh, the statement would not be inaccurate in the way that the current use is. Um, so I don't know if the restriction, I think it would um, be more uh, challenging regarding the First Amendment, um, possibly, but um, certainly if it's something you're interested in, I think we could, we could look at it. Um, one thing I will say, uh, you know, I used my same signs in the second um, campaign and I contemplated buying stickers that said reelect and putting them on. I just opted not to do that. But I think if a person wants to reuse signs, they could clearly um, do that or black out um, whatever is at issue. And of course, we know that we have to change the dates on when we put them out in the right of ways, et cetera. So there's already some editing that needs to happen. So mm -hmm. I did think about this because I really do care about waste and obviously efficient mm -hmm. use of taxpayer funds. So that was sort of the solution I had come to in my head that I'm sharing. Yeah, for me, stickers or markers would just look junky. Um, I use this font called Brandon Grotesque, which is just this beautiful. <laughs> Send me your sign <laughs> later. I'd love to see it. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's the best. I am. I actually think that um, I'm pretty sure that Anne Marie Mastracchio, when she ran for mayor, just bought a sticker that said mayor instead of state rep and put that on top of um, her former signs. Well, Representative Tuttle, me too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Representative Supika. Supika, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, thank you. Um, Representative Rakowski, I had a question about um, use of the office, office title. Um, I see a lot of on signs that'll say somebody's name and then underneath it just says state representative. Um, is that, you know, is, a, is like just a way to let people know that that's the office that they're running for? Would this bill try to make it so that's not possible? That, that they couldn't just have their name and then the word state representative underneath it? Um, I think we'd want to look at the language more closely, but it does say uh, names or identifies the candidate using the title of office. Um, so uh, I think one would identify themselves as using the title office by saying, for instance, as I've done on my screen, Rep. Nicole Rahowski, um, okay. or in the case of the testimony I provided, um, it said compliments of state representative first name, last name. Um, I would say that's a pretty direct and obvious use of the title with the person's name. Um, I, my signs say Nicole Rahowski main house. I think that very few people are going to write state representative only because of the uh, font size <laughs> and spacing as it seems the topic of the day with the VLA committee. Um, but I think that's a good question to make it clear that if you're identifying the office you're running for, as opposed to using it as a title, um, those are two different, uh, cases. So thank you. All okay. right. Thank you. Okay. It's, any other questions? Uh, uh Chairman Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I didn't want to let my former seatmate go without, um, <laughs> at least, uh, saying welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you're still sitting next to me on the screens if that, if that <laughs> happens, but, uh, 
Um, I, I just wanted to clarify, um, Representative Grahowski, you're not suggesting though that, um, let's say, um, Representative Tuttle, for example, wants to run again for, for Senate and it was a member of the Senate, he couldn't call himself Senator Tuttle. You're saying basically that you're, you're just speaking specifically to people who've never held that office before. Is that correct? Yeah, and I, I would want to just take a, that was my intention with the provisor's office. And I want to just take a closer look through that if the committee is interested in moving forward on this, just to make sure that's the case, because that is a common usage that happens. But I would ask that he not say reelect Senator Tuttle, you know, 10, 20 years, however many years it's been. Um, the voters may be less confused in that case than they are when it's a quick term limited switch that happened. Mm -hmm. Which is what well, heaven to. help us, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Representative Grahowski. Great to see you again. Thank you for having me. This is my first public hearing, so I appreciate how smoothly it's going. Always. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony, Representative Grahowski. You're welcome. And I don't have anybody else registered. The only one I had was Patty Du Bois, but I think she had to run. Um, so with that, we will close the public hearing on LD 157. And next up, we're gonna move to LD 59, an act to define the term unenrolled political action committee. And for that, we have the sponsor, I believe is Representative Pluger. And I, that's all I'm seeing at the moment. You've got me here? Yep, yep. It's hard to find with all the boxes, but welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And we're ready to start, is that right? Yeah, you're good to go. Great, good morning, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and the other distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. I'm Representative Bill Pluker from Warren, and I represent House District 95, which is Appleton Hope, Eastern Union, and Warren. I'm speaking today to present LD59, an act to define the term unenrolled political action committee. Last spring, LD 1902, an act to define the term caucus political action committee expanded the laws governing the financing of political action committees, ensuring the Commission on Governmental Ethics and Election Practices had the ability to enforce rules on these entities. It specifically defined caucus political action committee as a political action committee or PAC designated by a party leader in the legislature to promote the election of candidates to office. Without this new law, the Maine Ethics Commission was unable to fully enforce ethics rules around legislator-led caucus PACs. An unintended consequence of this law was to make it impossible for a PAC to be formed by the unenrolled members of the legislature. It cut off access to these PACs for approximately 30% of the electorate of Maine who are unenrolled from a party. This bill does nothing, this bill that I'm presenting today, LD59, does nothing to undo the achievements of LD1902 but makes it possible for the unenrolled members of the legislature, one in the House and one in the Senate, to form a PAC very similar to the caucus political action committees of the parties. The likeliest need for such a PAC would come in the case of an unenrolled clean elections candidate who had to go to a recount due to a close election result. Currently, clean elections funds cannot be spent after the election on recounts. There are a number of political potential needs for funds in the case of a recount, including hiring legal representation, potential fees to the Secretary of State's office and finding volunteers to help with the recount. Without access to an unenrolled political action committee, the candidate would have to pay out of pocket. And recently one an unenrolled candidate for office paid approximately $1,000 in the 2018 election for legal rep representation. Um, he either had to do that or walk away from his clean election candidate status and solicit funds personally. An unenrolled political action committee could also be used to train legislators in order to keep them up to date with changes in law and how to effectively legislate. Unenrolled legislators and candidates should have access to the same tools as those in the parties. I do not believe it was ever the intention of the committee to exclude unenrolled legislators from these tools or to disenfranchise their own unenrolled constituents. It's time to right the unintended consequences of the valuable legislation passed last year and allow unenrolled legislators a full voice in representing the people of Maine. Thank you for your time and consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Representative Pluker. Any questions from the committee? Uh, Chairman Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative Pluker. Um, I appreciate you bringing this before us for sure. Um, and I appreciate the, 
the um, the desire to make things equitable and fair. But I'm wondering, are, are, in essence, aren't you asking us to treat on enrolls as a political party in and of itself? Which I don't think it qualifies as that status. Is that correct? No, we're not a party. We're explicitly unenrolled from a party. And so, no, I'm not asking to become a party, but I am asking for an opportunity to have access to the to this PAC, um, which is not, in this case, not a party PAC, but it is an unenrolled uh an unenrolled pack. So just for unenrolled folks. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Yes. Yep. Uh, so uh, there isn't anything as far as I could tell. Um, and again, my just a, a quick glance last night, there's nothing prohibiting um, independence from forming a pack on their own, is there? I mean, as a, as a leadership pack? Nope. Uh, well, we don't, I don't think we have a leadership standard. I, I think it's uh, right. No, we could uh, still form leadership pack. Right. I don't think there's a legal definition for leadership pack. But what I saw for a political action committee um, definition was um, can include any separate or segregated fund established by any corporation, membership organization, cooperative or labor or other organizations whose purpose is to initiate or influence a campaign. So why why couldn't the independents form a pack under those guidelines? You could, but you could not form a pack of the sort that parties are able to form in order to defend recounts, as I mentioned, or to go for new legislators who might want to roll, enroll or who might want to run or to educate exist, existing legislators. So is this, a, this is a pack with a particular role that we would like to have access to. So there, you can find, we could start other packs of other sorts, this is true. But the, the law last year specifically excluded us from this sort of pack. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this year when I combed through ethics reports and I looked at you know specific PAC spending, I did notice that there were some expenditures, independent expenditures made by PACs that I would consider as partisan PACs, those, you know, by, you know, leaders in, in certain parties. Um, and they were making these independent expenditures on behalf of um, unenrolled that were running um, for, for office. Do you believe that um, partisan, partisan PACs should be spending in elections for, you know, unenrolled candidates to curry favor? Uh, if that party decided they wanted to do that work, then I guess that's the choice of the party in that case. Uh, I think the great thing about having access to the sort of pack this bill creates is it means that we would have a little, as on enrolled, we would have more independence and not have to look to the party packs for, uh, for support as we'd be able to do it ourselves. So it gives us just a little bit more independence when it comes to finances. Any Next other question. any other questions for the bill sponsor? Seeing none, thank you, Representative Pluger. Thank you. Great. I believe we've got a co-sponsor, Representative Reisman, here uh, today. Welcome, Representative. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, can Can you folks hear me? Okay. Yep. I'm always testing my audio here. Very good. Thank you for allowing me this time. And good morning, uh, Chairman Lucini and Chairman Cayazzo and other distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. I am Representative Walter Reisman from Harrison and represent House District 69, which includes Bridgeton, Harrison, and Denmark. I'm speaking today as a sponsor in support of LD 59, an act to define the term unenrolled political action committee. I am currently one of five independents currently serving in the House of Representatives. I am now in my second term, and I have worked with people from both sides of the aisle, plus some now retired great independents or unenrolled, such as Norm Higgins, Don Marine, and Ken Ackley. Undoubtedly, they proved their presence played an important role, even though considered unenrolled. Why are caucus PACs important? They serve a crucial role to cover costs related to recruiting candidates, making available funding for election issues, and provide training of new or existing legislators. The last 
legislature took some great first steps in providing the appropriate structure and system for the two organized parties to provide financial support to party-specific caucus political action committees. I hope you will agree that we need to provide for a strong and meaningful legislative system by allowing for all members and party designations to operate on an equal basis. This legislation will allow for unenrolled members to form and control their own PAC. By voting an ought to pass recommendation, this committee can take steps to bring fairness to caucus PACs. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Representative. Any questions? Representative Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I have a question about this. So like if we do have an unenrolled PAC, you know, obviously, you know, there's a Republican PAC and there's a Democratic PAC and, you know, they share common sort of beliefs. Uh, would the people that, that ran sort of this unenrolled PAC, would they have to spend on training and all of those things by all unenrolled or for all unenrolled candidates? Would you have to support all unenrolled candidates or would you be able to pick and choose um, what unenrolled candidates you actually worked with based on the sort of their, their own political beliefs? That's, that's what I'm trying to understand. Unenrolled is, you know, a non-party affiliation. Would there be a commitment to, or would it be in statute that you would have to spend that money or share that money with all unenrolled candidates on the ballot? Thank you. Well, thank you for that good question. Uh, representative. My understanding currently of political PACs is as they are controlled to uh, the circumstance of making their own decisions about who they might support and who they might spend money on. So uh, having an unenrolled PAC, which is uh, formed in the same kind of structure as uh, political party PACs, I think that the the PACs involved, our PAC, the un, an unenrolled PAC, would have the same possibilities as political PACs, i.e., they would make the decisions of who they would support and uh, spend money on. Any further, yeah, follow up? But how would you, what I'm wondering is how you would determine, you know, who who gets to decide how to spend, you know, that, that money if unenrolled affiliation is, is what becomes a part of it? Would it be just that elected unenrolled, you know, people that, that fundraised into that pack would be choosing how to spend that money, you know, and I, I'm guessing that, you know, you would spend based on, you know, whoever is controlling that pack's ideological beliefs that, you know what I mean, hopefully, you know, align with your own. I'm just, it's hard for me to determine what an unenrolled unenrolled voter or unenrolled candidate is and what their beliefs are. Can you explain how you determine those beliefs? Thank you. Uh, I would uh, perhaps defer to Representative Pluker on this, and then maybe I can add more to it. I see uh, has hand up. Yeah, sorry, that's Representative. That's not how public hearings work. You can't testify multiple times. <laughs> But Representative Pluker, you're welcome to be at the work session. So if you'd like to answer okay. Representative Reisman, you can. Well, I, I think the intent of this legislation is to level the playing field. So whatever is possible for political action committees of organized parties would be possible for the unenrolled PAC. And I think we can, we can delve more into this at the work session when that happens. Uh, you good, Representative Corey? Yeah. Uh, Representative McCrate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question. Um, it occurs to me to wonder whether this would eliminate the ability of a partisan PAC to uh, spend money on an independent candidate, or would they still be able to do that? Um, I, I can only uh, offer my opinion on this. And I would say that those political party PACs make their own decisions about who they want to support, period. We can talk some more about that in the work session. Yeah, I think that's right. 
Any other questions? <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you, Representative, uh, for being here today. Thank you. I'm seeing no other co-sponsors. We will move to public testimony. And again, uh, we'll remind people that you have three minutes and we'll start with Bob Howe. I believe he signed. Or, uh, actually, I'm not sure if he's on this one. We had uh, Anna Keller for this, but I believe, she, Bob, you're filling in for her. All right, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had to get to a full view before I could get to my unmute button. Uh, I am Bob Howe, as um, I was an hour or two ago. I'm speaking here today on LD 59 for the Maine Citizens for Clean Elections. Um, neither for nor against the bill. I won't read all of the testimony. I believe you had it uh, submitted already. Um, let me just start with the substantive parts of it. We believe that legislators who are not aligned with a political party should be treated fairly and equitably in the conduct of legislative business, the allocation of legislative resources, and with respect to any rules regulating fundraising and campaign activities. We believe, excuse me, although most legislators have been aware of the concept of leadership PACs and caucus PACs for many years, until recently these terms are only informal labels applied to certain PACs and had no special legal meaning. That is, any person or a group of people has always had the power to form a PAC. And a PAC formed by legislators or by a legislative caucus is really no different from any of the dozens of other PACs operating in Maine at any time. Excuse me. Um, the rules and reporting requirements are much the same. There is no law needed to allow anyone to form a PAC whether a partisan legislator, a caucus, an unenrolled legislator, or any person on the street. The one area where LD21 singles out, a, uh, I'm sorry, Title 21A, the election laws, singles out a special type of legislative PAC relates to payment for recounts. Section 1018B, subsection two, allows a candidate in a recount to receive donations of unlimited size from party committees and caucus political action committees. This would appear to give an advantage to a recount candidate who is in a political party and or who is aligned with a caucus political action committee. I would point out though that the section allows attorneys, consultants and their firms to make donations directly to any candidate in the recount without limitations since nearly all donations and recounts consist of the in-kind contribution of attorneys, consultants, and their firms, current law already allows independent candidates to accept this crucial type of support without running a file of the contribution as opposed to donation limits or restrictions. For transparency purposes, these donations must be reported to the Ethics Commission. In addition, since a recount happens a few weeks after voting ends, there is a reasonable question whether in-time contributions of attorney time during a recount could be construed as an attempt to influence an election and therefore that they may not meet the definition of contributions under the law. The statute refers to these as donations rather than contributions. We also note the bill seems to say that there's only one unenrolled uh, caucus pack per chamber. Uh, we would note that uh, all unenrolled legislators do not necessarily subscribe to the same philosophies and may not uh, necessarily want to participate jointly in this regard. Great. Finally, Mr. Howe, if, yeah, if you can finish up, we've, we've hit the time. But you can I know Mr. Howe's just held up his timer. I didn't see I the number. That. <laughs> You've got the written testimony. We'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Howe. Uh, any questions from the committee? Uh, Chairman Chiazzo. Thank you. I just wanted to apologize to Mr. Howe. We're still working on a on a better timing mechanism. So I, I know when you're reading, it's hard to see that. Hopefully the little yeah, thing is enough. Bring that big uh, clock home, I guess. <laughs> it was a lot easier in the committee room. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Things are. Yeah. 
Any other questions for Mr. Howe? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thanks. Next on the list, we have Kent Ackley, a former member of this committee, actually. And I believe that's it. If there's anyone else in the attendee room who wishes to testify on this one, if you can do the raise hand function, we can call you. But I think this may be it for this bill, and then the rest will be for the for the final bill of our of our morning. So, do we have Mr. Ackley taking a second? There we go. How's that, Mr. Chair? You're good. You're good. Welcome All right. back. <laughs> hey, good to see you, Louis. Uh, Chairs Lucchini and Chiazzo, veterans of uh, members of the VLA committee, I'm uh, testifying today in favor of LD59, an act to define the term unenrolled political action committee. I can see there are lots of new faces on the committee. And uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ken Ackley, served in the 128th and 129th. Uh, for the towns of Monmouth, Litchfield, and Wales. Representative Pluker asked me to address some of the history on this bill. In the 129th, a similar bill was passed into law that defined the term caucus political action committee uh, for members of the legislature that were enrolled in a party. And despite at that time our, the legislative independent wishes, um, we were not included in that bill. And so it's with great anticipation that we uh, have uh, we come to this long waited for public hearing. Um, this bill is about establishing equality among legislators, not just in title, but in statute. In the last five sessions of the legislature, there, be, there have been between four and seven independent members. In fact, in the 128th and the 129th, we operated much like a caucus, a party caucus might operate, uh, whereby we met every morning prior to session discussed upcoming business of the day, educated each other, uh, and shared information on current issues. This bill is really about giving every member of the legislature the same opportunities to be successful, regardless of party affiliation or non-affiliation. And I, uh, I'm certainly happy to answer some of the questions you might have. I know uh, Representative Corey brought up uh, a question about um, uh, uh, how decisions might be made in terms of uh, funding being allocated. And, and my, my answer to Representative Corey's question is, uh, it would be made in the same way that the party uh, uh, political action committees uh, do their decision making. Um, the members agree on a uh, leader. They might also agree on some guidance for how uh, funds would be allocated so that perhaps there's some limit to whatever uh, decision-making process the leader might have and, uh, and then decisions are made. And, you know, I mean, this is uh, exactly the same sort of um, uh, process that uh, uh, the other legislators enjoy. Uh, and I think, uh, there's certainly an opportunity, other ways to work around not having this, but the, the, the reality of this particular political action committee format is, um, is about uh, colleagues being equal in every, sense of the, in every sense of the law. And with that said, I'm happy to answer questions uh, if there are others. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions from the committee? Representative McCrae. Whoops. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi there, Honorable Kent Ackley. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, Good to see you, Jay. I, you, yeah, you too. Um, just in your opinion, would this um, prevent a political action pack from contributing to an independent or just add another option? It would simply be another option and an equal option in the eyes of the law. Um, Certainly you can't, I mean, given the Citizens United environment that we see ourselves in today, uh, limiting anyone's ability to give money to anywhere um, has certain uh, First Amendment right implications that would be very difficult to, to justify preventing. So uh, 
so you know the observation is right hey we could go you know i i could i could go out and form the ken ackley pack if i really wanted to uh and do fundraising for that and accomplish the same goals as uh as what this pack this type of pack might do but uh you know really the 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 point of this matter is is one of equity and fairness in statute um uh, we have uh, in statute, uh, much to our chagrin last uh, session, a law that was created that uh, on its surface gives party membership privileges that uh, non-party members of the legislature do not get to enjoy. This, this bill would solve that problem. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, Representative Corey. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm, I'm still struggling with the idea that, you know, even based on an election amongst unenrolled members that, you know, there could still be a prescribed ideology based on that, that election, which sort of stands in the, the face of what it kind of means to be unenrolled. Any, anybody can run unenrolled, you know, whether you could be, you know, left of left, right of Right, but you would still have a pack sitting there that you know might might be making ideological decisions, you know, for for unenrolled candidates. Well, how do you how do you square that? Other than I guess you're saying fairness, right? Well, uh, there there's uh, there's a much larger uh, uh, possibility than right and left, and I think one of the things that uh, uh, our uh, caucus demonstrated last session in the 129th is that folks like Don Marian and Norm Higgins and Ken Ackley and Walter Reisman and Bill Pluker can all sit at the same table, have reasonable conversations and agree to disagree. Um, if we're doing fundraising in a way that encourages uh, non-party citizen, uh, citizens who, who simply want to participate in their own government, um, I think that might be the the only ideology that we uh, uh, we actually shared as a group is that that's a good thing. Um, you know, thirty three percent of the electorate is unenrolled. Seven percent of the legislature, I'm sorry, even it's, it's uh, three percent of the legislature is unenrolled. Um, I, I think there are lots of opportunities for the legislature to become more representative of the electorate than, uh, than is, uh, is currently demonstrated in, in the way folks are elected. Um, again, I, I see this no different than uh, the way that uh, uh, parties organize uh, their own political action committees. Um, uh, we see a lot of fluidity in the way that uh, some of those funding decisions are made, um, not necessarily ideologically based. Uh, sometimes it is, sometimes that changes. And so uh, I, I hear you. It's, it's, it's a different concept to say um, uh, we think that there ought to be more independent people uh, uh, serving in a citizen's legislature. But I think that would be a good thing for the state of Maine. So then listening, listening to what you just said, you know, basically you said that, okay, so like if the one sort of thing that you can all agree on is that there should be more unenrolled, you know, candidates, you know, and that there shouldn't be, you know, a political, you know, prescription, you know what I mean? Whether it's left of left, right of right, you know, if you're right there, you know, dead, dead in the center, would you be comfortable if we actually wrote that into statute? that said that, look, you know, like the purpose of, you know, an unenrolled pack is to support all unenrolled, you know, candidates based on would. Listen, I, I, uh, their uh, I don't, I, I certainly think that uh, 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 more unenrolled candidates uh, running for office in the state of Maine is a good thing, uh, uh, given our current state of uh, uh, political discourse. Um, uh, if this PAC uh, had some prescription about, um, uh, you know, uh, that we had to spend money on every candidate that showed up at the door, um, uh, I, I don't think, I think that would be certainly uh, uh, some concern on First Amendment grounds. 
Um, but secondly, I don't think the parties, the parties aren't told to do that. Uh, uh, the, the party caucus, the caucus packs aren't told that they absolutely have to spend money on every party candidate. In fact, there are lots of reasons why they wouldn't spend money on certain party candidates, right? Part, some, some candidates don't need it. Other candidates do. Some candidates are uh, a very reasonable, high quality candidate and other candidates are maybe not so much. Um, so uh, it's, it's uh, uh, I, I, I guess it comes back to the point of uh, in this bill, we're looking for parity with the other members of the legislature and, uh, and this is one way that we can do it with this bill. Any further questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Good, Good to see you. Again. you. Yeah, bye-bye. Any, I believe that's it for this bill. So with that, we will close the public hearing on LD59. So next up, we have LD53. That's the last uh, bill on our list. It's an act to limit political advertising. And I don't believe the sponsor could be here. So Senator Farron's going to go to bat for him, the pinch hitter. So. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Lucchini, members of the uh, Veterans and Legal Affairs. Um, I am not Kevin O'Connell, uh, <laughs> who uh, represents 128 in most of the city of Brewer. And he apologizes that he cannot deliver this testimony in person, but he's grateful to Senator Brad Fair for doing so on my, on my behalf because he, oh, no, he, he, there was a bunch of accolades. I'm not going to get there. Well, <laughs> um, I said, I submitted LD53 in response to feedback from many constituents. I'm sure this feedback will sound familiar to members of this committee as well. I've heard from so many residents of Brewer that their mailboxes were overwhelmed with the political flyers for months on end last year. The people I hear from are concerned about the waste and frankly, the inconvenience of finding their mailboxes stuffed with campaign messages. I recognize that any solution to this problem must protect the rights guaranteed to us within the First Amendment. With this in mind, I present LD53 as a concept draft so that this committee may choose to act in a way that protects our constitutional rights. I mentioned to uh, Representative O'Connell that was, that was called punting the ball to the committee. Um, <laughs> I suggest one possibility would be to enact parameters around when campaign mail is sent. Similar to the way that our state restricts the length of time that campaign signs can be placed in the public way. Three months could be a reasonable starting point for discussion. Thank you for consideration of this pro uh, proposal and for your attention to the concerns my constituents have raised. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have for me and hope you will feel welcome to contact me. Um, in all seriousness, Kevin was uh, busy today working at, at Bangor Hydro, uh, uh, the, the, the new company now, but uh, uh, he did ask me to put that out here. We had some conversations before I did this, folks, and, and one of the things, having been on VLA before, and I know we've kill, kicked some of the things around, are the constitutional issues and the restraints and, and things along that way. I also personally have a hard time um, with a concept draft. I, I think that we as legislatures should do our work up front instead of just throwing a, a blanket out there without a definitive problem and a solution. However, especially for new legislators that have not been in the process before um, and the timeline that we had and with COVID and everything else, I understand um, why we're seeing more concept drafts this time around. And uh, I really think Kevin's looking for some thoughts and guidance and, and being able to give his um, constituents some feedback on this. I told him, you know, I, I stopped taking my grandson to the post office on Saturday mornings with me because he'd look in the trash and see pictures, my, my pictures in the trash. I don't know why Bampo was getting thrown into the trash. And I, that, that's a whole nother issue. But so I think we can relate to the to the to the issues going on with it and, and everything else. So um, with that being said, I really don't have I don't have any more information to give you. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to 
to work session and Representative O'Connell when, when the time comes forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. I, uh, I collected any of those I saw and I kept them. They're on the wall over here. So, <laughs> so you know. Thank you. Um, <laughs> any questions for Senator Farron? Seeing none, I'm sure Representative O'Connell's busy working on the lines the day after a giant snowstorm. So, <laughs> yes. All right, great. So, I guess uh, for this bill, we had, I believe, uh, Mr. Howe again and also Suzanne. Uh, Goucher. And we'll start with Mr. Howe, if you're there, um, to testify on this bill. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Bob Howe again from Brunswick, representing the Maine Citizens for Clean Elections. You have our statement. I'm going to read the essence of it. The 2020 elections provided, a, uh, and by the way, it was speaking neither for nor against this bill, the 2020 elections provide a vivid reminder of the pervasive impact on our democracy of large amounts of money originating from a small number of corporations and wealthy donors, contributors. Many of these uh, contributors are not Mainers, but spend their money here to try to tip the balance of the elections in one way or another to have an impact on the balance of power in Washington. The money flows through candidate campaigns, special interest PACs, and political party committees. We heard after the 2020 elections how, from many everyday voters who are searching for a solution that would allow the, to slow the avalanche of advertising on television in the mailbox and through nearly every other conceivable medium. Representative O'Connell's concept bill is a response to the frustration of many who feel that campaigns should be returned. Mr. Howe, I think the mute button got triggered on yours somehow. There you go. Well, I don't know when, when that happened, but- It was only for I'm a couple happy. seconds there. All yeah. right, Representative O'Connell's concept bill is a response to the frustration of many who feel that campaigns should be returned to the people. Um, we agree that something must be done to return the focus of our elections to the people and to preserve and protect the principle of one person, one vote. The statement goes on to cite, cite a number of uh, court cases. Uh, the bottom line of them is that a ban or, or restriction on advertising would almost certainly be subjected to strict court scrutiny and would likely be struck down. The legal restrictions imposed by cases such as these have led many folks to pursue other policy options such as public funding programs, which this organization has championed, or contributions, limits, and restrictions, and I would add to that increased transparency, instead of bans on advertising. In fact, Maine has made great strides in these areas and has served as a model for other states and cities. It is challenging work thanks to court precedents that have over the years limited the constitutional path to reform. We stand ready to pursue worthwhile ideas that improve elections and strengthen democracy and we believe there are ways to preserve and protect First Amendment rights and also ensure that voters are well served. We look forward to other testimony today and to the full draft of the concept bill. And I thank you. Now I will mute intentionally. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Howe. Uh, any questions from members of the committee for Mr. Howe? Uh, Representative Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, from, from your organization's perspective, you've got this whole Sean Connery vibe going on today. <laughs> Everything, but, <laughs> but regardless of that. Um, Always does. It does. It, it looks great. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I always, I always think when I, when I look at these things and, you know, being, being a candidate in the past and being somebody that's interested in politics, I'm always reading the little disclosure, you know, statements at the bottom. And you'd sort of mention that, you know, public funding, do you know what I mean? May somehow be the, the answer to this, you know, barely any of this really seems to be happening under public funding and, you know, even less so even based on, you know, maybe traditional funding. A lot of this seems to be PAC independent expenditures, you know, that are kind of, happening 
you know, out there. And that's probably, you know, where, you know, the limits probably would need to happen to, you know, cut down on the, the volume of the advertising. But on the same level, you're an attorney, um, you know, that, you know, the First Amendment, you know, somehow, somehow protects that. How, how do you think we can cut down on some of these, you know, independent expenditures? I, have people thought about ways to do this outside of public funding. I actually think public funding actually just creates a lot of independent expenditures, but is there just no answer here? <laughs> well, well, first, yes, Sean Connery reference threw me off track for a minute there. Uh, second of all, while, while I'm frequently accused of being an attorney, I'm not. Oh. <laughs> and Maine Centers for Clean Elections actually has legal counsel. Um, but I, you're right that independent expenditure is are often a way around uh, restrictions in in other campaign finance laws. And I don't know that short of um, uh, somehow doing away with Citizens United and some of the other court decisions that we cite, uh, this is a perfect solution. But we, we do believe that public funding um, has limited to some degree the influence of special interest money on campaigns, at least as they influence directly the candidates for office. Is there, is there any data on that or is it? Um, off the top of my head, I can't cite any, but I will do it. I will come up with what I can for the work session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Howe. Great, and next up we have Suzanne Goucher. Welcome. Thank you, good to see you. Good to see thank you, Thank you, too. Senator, Senator Lucchini and Representative Chiazzo and members of the committee. My name is Suzanne Goucher. I'm a resident of the town of Manchester and I am the president and CEO of the Maine Association of Broadcasters, which represents the 150 radio and television stations that are federally licensed to serve the state of Maine. And I would simply echo some of Mr. Howe's comments and to say to the committee that the courts have always held political speech to the highest First Amendment protections. And so if the committee intends to develop this bill, I would simply urge you to proceed very, very carefully. And with that, and two and a half minutes left to go on the timer, I will stop and take your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And Brevity is the, brevity is the soul of wit. That's it. <laughs> and the state does get sued a lot on these issues, so it, it is an interesting one. Um, any any questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Nice to see you. Oh, oh, sorry. Wait, wait, I've got sorry. one. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh. sorry. Yep. Representative McCray. Thank you. I couldn't find my hand. Sorry. Sorry. I'll leave more time. <laughs> Miss Goucher, um, the sponsor, I think, in his write up mentioned the limits on um, political signs, for example, we have so many weeks we can post those. It, do you see that as something that could be adapted here or would that run into the same issue that you've raised? Uh, I am not a lawyer and I don't know that those restrictions have ever been challenged. I think it would be an interesting test case to see if you could put out a sign beyond the limits of what's in statute and, uh, you know, have it stand up to court scrutiny. I, I, I'd actually have to look at the statute. I, as I recall, the limitation is on taking down your signs within a certain period of time after an election. I don't know that there's a period of time before an election that there's a limit on when you could put a sign out. Yeah, it's both. But I, it's been a has it. Yeah, it's been a while since I've looked at that statute. We right. do as broad. We do as broadcasters have restrictions on the rates we can charge to candidates, and candidates under federal regulation get the lowest unit rate of a station. Forty five days within forty five days before a primary and within 60 days before a general election. And lowest unit rate calculation is enormously complicated. Uh, it, it, it just takes in everything 
having to do with what a station does. But what it's intended to do is ensure that candidates are given the lowest rate that a station charges to any advertiser. So we, we do have some time restrictions in that respect. Thank you. Uh, Representative Kinney. <laughs> We're having, I think we're having some sound issues, Representative. Is that everybody else can't hear? Okay. Can you hear me now? I'll ask uh, Ms. Goucher a question while we try to get give Representative Kinney a little time. So. Regarding commercials, no, is that working? Oh, it's working now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I switched yep. to the computer. I don't know. I'm ha I'm having some real difficulties. I couldn't hear Ms. Goucher's uh, testimony. Brief as it was, it flipped out on me. So I must be having some issues on my computer. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think you got. Oh. I guess I, I I was just trying to figure out was she for or against neither for nor against I guess that's neither neither neither, neither for nor I was just pointing out the constitutional issues involved okay. in restricting okay. political speech. Thank you. Great, and, and I appreciate that because that's some of my. If someone could figure out how to restrict the robocalls on car warranties and credit cards, I'd be very happy. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> And so, uh, Ms. Goucher, just regarding like political commercials, a lot of that um, falls under the FCC, FCC laws, is that right, rather than state laws? Well, broadcasters are federally licensed. Right. And so we're governed by FCC regulations, Federal Communications Commission regulations, yes. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? I mean, we, all, we also do have to abide by state law in regards to candidate disclaimers and sponsor identification on um, ads and, you know, the Secretary of State's office and the Ethics Commission lay out some specifics on how you identify who is the sponsor of a candidate ad. So we, we follow those guidelines as well, but it's primarily FCC regulations. Great, thanks. Any, anything else? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Suzanne. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. It's all Great. in the world, isn't it? Oh, it's, yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, so seeing no other people here to testify, uh, we'll close the public hearing on LD 53, an act to limit political advertising. And so it's just about one o'clock now. <clears throat> I think the plan, we'll just take a quick, lunch break to give people time um, to get lunch and and perhaps do a caucus if needed. And then we can jump into the budget. We'll try to, we'll, we may switch the two around the budget and the liquor presentation. Um, so we don't leave the general kind of waiting around. So we'll, we'll try to come back at 1.30 and we'll deal with the budget, remaining budget line items. And then Mr. after Chairman. that, uh, yeah, just hold on a second. I can, yeah. So after after 1.30, we'll do the supplemental budget. And then when that's done, we'll, we'll do the liquor presentation um, by, by Janet. Representative Tuttle. Yes, I had a question of uh, Representative Dalloff of Rumford being an old Sanford wrestler. I remember a number of Dalloffs that were on the Rumford wrestling team. Is she related to any? Yes, sir. Actually, my, it was my husband that started all the dollars wrestling. He, he was the first one to, and then took all his brothers along with him. He, he so, was a state champion, wasn't he? He had a brother that was. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I remember him, I remember the family well. That was back in the late 60s and early 70s. So that, yeah. All the 70s were a good year. <laughs> well, that's good to know that. Thank you, Representative. Thank, thank you. Uh, Janet, did you have any? Anything else you want to add before? Okay, all right. So uh, we'll uh, we'll take a break. The um, we'll take a recess. The uh, our clerks 
account will keep running. So this meeting will, will continue going. We'll take a lunch break to 1.30. Um, so you can leave this account or you can leave this meeting and then come back using the same link uh, as before. So the same link will work and we'll try to get started right at 1.30 to take up the supplemental budget. So we'll recess and, and see you all then.
This was just a positive today. And this was the one from before, so I don't know what you're doing. That's... Speaking of the devil. I feel so frustrated. It's like Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes, we can hear you, Representative. 
Well, too too bad for you, right, Senator? All right. No, it's great. I love it. Great. Uh, Karen, I like that, uh, the name thing. That was a good idea. And if Karen or Janet can bump me up to co-host so I can see who's in the room, it'd be awesome. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right, uh, I, think, I think we've got most everybody back <clears throat> so we can get restarted with the afternoon session of uh, the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. <clears throat> and so as our schedule says, we'll do, we'll start with the 1.30 um, supplemental budget items that were tabled from uh, Monday. And then after that, uh, we'll have Janet give us a, a helpful uh, presentation on the liquor laws. Uh, that'll be good, uh, really good background information before we start dealing with those bills when they, they come before our committees. Um, great, and it looks like we've got uh, Director Richmond here with us and it's good to see you. And Karen, just for your reference, we're gonna be going through those uh, voting items um, on the, I should have called you earlier, sorry. Um, on the voting sheet, starting on page. It's reference numbers 126 to 139. They start on the bottom of page four. And I also keep track of them. Technically you're not supposed to have, Karen have to keep track of them. She's just being very helpful. Okay. <laughs> Karen, are you good with calling the roll or? Okay, thank you. All right, so I think we can get started. Janet, are we ready to, to roll? Are you going to share the screen again? or I'm happy to do that. I didn't know if you wanted to have a general discussion first. I defer that to you. Sure, yeah. I think basically we're just going to pick up where we left off. I know we had some questions on a number of the uh, veteran services lines and, you know, having worked a long time with Senator Farron and others, we, you know, we, we try not to we know Dave's working with a pretty small group over there, but they do amazing, amazing work and we don't want to see them without resources, you know, so um, there were some concerns that we wanted to take just a little more time. Um, and thanks for being here with us, Director Richmond. And if there's questions as we go through these, perhaps we can um, ask questions and just kind of talk it through. And if, if people are ready, we can vote. The um, Appropriations Committee wants us to report back this week by Friday. Um, so that's kind of why it was a fairly quick turnaround. So I think with that, Janet, we're ready to, to screen share if you are. Hopefully you see this first initiative, number 126, reference number. It's the first one you tabled. It reduces funding by reallocating office and other supplies expenses to an, an allowable other special revenue funds funding source. And the justification indicates this initiative will have no impact 
as this underutilized other special revenue funds account for the Maine Veterans Memorial Cemetery Maintenance Fund can absorb these expenses. Great, and again, if anybody has uh, questions or wants to discuss, if you can raise your hand virtually because I can't actually see all the squares at once when we're in this mode. So um, that'll, that'll be the way that I can kind of see you. Uh, Representative Tuttle. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to get Dave's comment on this line if we could. Sure. Um, thank you for having me uh, back again today. Um, this item here is talking about a special revenue account and there's two that, that we, we really leaned on for the curtailment. Our, uh, one of them is a 014 state account and one of them is a 013 federal account. This one is talking about the 014 special revenue account that derives its funds from primarily from a tax checkoff. So um, when somebody's filing for the taxes, they can check off and, and uh, elect to give uh, some money to the Maine Veterans Memorial Cemetery system for the purpose of maintenance. So we, we've, uh, we do have this account right now. The balance is in the neighborhood of $108,000. So it's, it's kind of a savings account. We've used it, for instance, if a, if a boiler blew up in the Caribou Cemetery or something like that, we had to replace it. Uh, we, we might use it for that, some unexpected maintenance cost. So here we've uh, planned on utilizing about $42,000 uh, in FY21. Great. And, and director, does this one, I can't recall the name of the account, but does this one get money from the gambling um, cascade too, or is that a different, one of the cemetery maintenance ones does, and I can't remember if it was this or another. Right. It, it's probably not as critically important now, but. The Coordinated Veterans Assistance Fund is 014 011073. Uh, and that one has a cash balance right now, 40,000 in it. And that 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 um, Coordinated Veterans Fund is the one that cascades. So okay. $15,000 off the top goes to the DAV van service. Mm -hmm. And then as the year goes along, um, as the cash balance builds up from gambling, um, we, um, by statute, are required to make payments to American Legion and VFW. And whatever money's left from that goes to the homeless stand down at Vilgus. And then if there's any money left after that, it goes to purchase flags. Um, so that, that's that account, Senator. Okay. Thanks, well, my other Well, my other question, David, are we planning in the regular budget to reimburse that, or are we just taking it and not putting it back? To answer your question, uh, Representative Tuttle, it's, we get about around $20,000 a year from the tax checkoff, yeah. historically. So yeah. we're, we're, um, elect, we're uh, planning to spend 42,000. So we, had a, we have a fairly large balance in there, it's 108,000. So yep. It's, yep. it's not sustainable. We're spending more than we're, we're going to be making in that account, but we have a fair, uh, amount of savings in the account. So it, it'll, it'll work for FY21 and probably 22 and 23, but eventually it, it'll catch up with us. All right, Dave, thank you. I have no more questions at this time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Director. Um, I know everybody's gotta make tough decisions. And so this is, you know, find the way to find money. Is there any other discussion or do we have a, a motion on, on this line item? Uh, Senator Farron. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I make a motion that we move reference 126, we move in to the supplemental budget. Great, so we have a motion to move it in by Rep uh, Senator Farron and do we have a second? You have a second. Okay, and seconded by Representative, Representative Tuttle. Tuttle. Any further discussion on this line item? Uh, seeing none, Karen, if, if you don't mind calling the roll, it'd be great. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Barron. Yes. Senator Barron, yes. 
Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. yes. Representative, Representative Kinney. Kinney. Yes. yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dollis. Yes. Representative Dollis, yes. So is that 12? Okay, thanks. That's what I had. So 12 0. Great. Thank you. So we'll move on to uh, the next item, which is uh, reference number 127. Reference number 127. I'm sorry about the noise. They're drilling somewhere near my office. <laughs> I don't know why. I hope the ceiling doesn't fall down. Okay, representative, <laughs> reference number 127 reduces funding by freezing one vacant office associate two position. And the justification statement indicates it results in additional workload for the business manager. Uh, Representative Kinney. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm um, just wondering how long this position has been vacant. Um, Representative Kinney, we've never filled it. We're in the process of filling it. We, we received this half-time Office Associate 2 position as part of um, LD184 passing. And it was, uh, the original ask was for a manager of, of that program and a, uh, an Office Associate 2 to assist with the uh, bookkeeping. So LD184 is the reimbursement from the state to transitional facilities uh, that assist homeless veterans with shelter, like um, Betsy and Ross House of Hope or United Veterans of Maine or Gary Owen. Um, and that position has never been filled. Um, and we elected to take um, the curtailment by leaving it vacant and realizing the savings from it. And our business manager um, is performing the work of vetting the programs that apply for that assistance. Quick follow up. Was that LD184? Was that in the 129th? I. I, I think it was actually the session before, but I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I, I can find that out. Uh, 184, sorry, was that when it was, did you ask? Yeah, I think that was in the last legislature. Um, uh, Representative Chiazzo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Richmond, are you, so is this a temporary uh, curtailment or are you planning on eliminating this in the biennial? Uh, in the biennium, representative, we plan, we're planning on eliminating the, uh, so we'd, we'd carry the same savings and it would be permanent in 22-23. Uh, Senator Farron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, and I appreciate, uh, Dave, what you folks are doing and going through this. My, you know, we had this conversation the other day about some other positions and and obviously the, the divam and what you folks do for our veteran population is very very important and i'm i am very concerned about eliminating position that we fought so hard to get it's not like some of the other departments that have you know hundreds of employees um whether it was fighting for three additional vso's or you know, anywhere along the lines for our veterans folks, um, it's this committee has worked very hard to, to preserve and protect those. So just just going on the record, I, I, I won't be supporting this initiative. And thanks, Senator. Um, I agree with Senator Farron. I think we've just from years of being on this committee, we've tried really hard to help fill your office, Dave, and we don't want to uh, to see it get 
short, I don't get the short end of the stick and um, certainly appreciate your willingness to, to work with the, the budget situation. But, um, and of course, recognizing fully that the appropriations committee could completely ignore everything that we re recommend today. <laughs> but I think it helps to send a message that we want to um, make sure the Bureau of Veteran Services is, is appropriately staffed, especially when it comes to veteran homelessness. Uh, Representative Tuttle. Yeah, uh, Senator, I agree with uh, Senator Fair, and I also would like to have this included. I have always said that we've always done the good things over the years. We've cut and cut and cut where other, other areas of state government have grown and grown. And so I would hope that we would stand unified as a committee to try and put this back into the budget. I know that the uh, committee can do what they want, but I, I think from a statement, uh, from our committee, I would hope that we would include this in the budget. Any other questions on this one? Or is there a motion? Make a motion. Okay, a motion to, to take this out, Representative? Yes. Okay, so motion. Uh, to not include this curtailment. I'll uh, second it. Okay, so the motion's by Representative Riley and it's seconded by uh, Representative Corey. Sorry, it's hard to see everybody. Okay, so any further questions from the committee or discussion on this line item? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. And Karen, if you're ready. Senator Zucchini, sorry. Senator Zucchini. <laughs> That's Zucchini? Zucchini? That was awesome. That's oh, how Louis, I called you that my freshman year. No. That's how people remember how to pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <Sure>. Yes. Senator <laughs> Zucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Dollis. Yes. <clears throat> Representative Dollis. Yes. 12 1. Okay. Thank you. And that was 12 0. With one absent. Okay, next up is 128. This initiative reduces funding by managing contract expenses for advertising and marketing services within available resources. According to the justification statement, it will result in additional workload for the Director of Communications. All right, so, so Director, um, this one is going to be absorbed within available resources. It's not um, dealing with positions or anything. No, it isn't. That's that's correct, uh, Senator. It uh, we had um, a fairly robust budget for marketing, and we used some of it um, initially a few years ago to hire a contracting a uh, marketing firm. So we we released them from that contract, um, and uh, our director of communication is, has been picking up. Um, a lot of the things like uh, marketing press releases and um, she's doing a great job and we uh, uh, we're fine without that contract. Great, thanks. I think that was another result of a commission that Senator Farron and I were on. Senator Farron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll make a motion that we move um, item number 129 in. 
or I think 128, right? Oh, 128. Yeah. 28. I'm sorry. 128. You're good. You're good. Getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. So a uh, motion by uh, Senator Farron and seconded by Representative McCrate. Any further discussion? Okay. Seeing none, we'll, uh, we'll proceed to the roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCright. Yes. Representative McCright, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar, yes. 12 1. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So we'll go to item 129. <coughs> Reference number 129 reduces funding by reallocating utility services expenses to an allowable federal funding source. And the justification statement explains this is a federal fund plot allowance account and indicates it might strain cash reserves in that account, although the director did walk back that statement a little bit last time. Uh, Representative Kinney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quick question, um, what is in the reserve account uh, currently, and how long will it last if we do dip into it? Um, yes, Representative. Um, the uh, the current cash balance of the account we're talking about here, 013-011030, um, our federal account, uh, the current cash balance is around 439256 That was as of uh, January 4th. It's right around in that balance. So we, um, we get about, on average, $200,000 a year in plot allowance revenue from the federal government. Um, it's about $742 each time we, we bury an eligible veteran. So with that $200,000 we have um, uh, coming in, we, we use that account to uh, pay for about two and a half positions, state positions. We're are funded, uh, funded out of this account. And we also use the money for, um, when we do a federal grant, we have to front the money for the design of whatever expansion we're doing. For example, we just completed a federal grant in Springvale at the Southern Maine Veterans Cemetery uh, to increase, to build some new burial sections, including a green burial area. And uh, we had to front the money, the state did, to. Uh, to the design, but we recoup that money when the grant is, uh, um, when it's reimbursed to us. But we use this account to, to front the money. And then we also use the account for any large expenses that aren't in our typical um, 010, our general fund budget. We had to buy some, like a new back backhoe loader or something like that. We might use this account. So, at $439,000 total cash balance right now, we're proposing to use 177,466 um, in personnel services for, for FY21 and 143,000 in all other. So that, that would offset our, our um, operating cost for the cemetery to a greater extent than we do normally. So we will be drawing into our savings um, more than we usually do, but we've got sufficient savings to do it. And the uh, original justification statement was a little bit, it's not wrong, it will strain the cash balance, but it's, we've got some in reserve. I should also mention that that's, uh, 
that 013 account gets two thirds of what we get in the form of plot allowance. The other third goes into another special revenue account, 014. Um, it's a 014 account. And it, that um, the intent of that account was to um, grow and then not be used until a cemetery in the system was no longer getting plot allowance in the same way that a, uh, a trust account would be open for a, a municipal cemetery or private cemetery. They might establish a trust so that there would be a revenue stream to maintain the cemetery in the future in perpetuity. And that was the intent with that um, legislation that created that account. We've never touched that account. And the, um, like I said, the, the intent is to use it when plot allowance no longer comes in. The cash balance of that account is currently uh, 1.5 million. And um, at such time when the state needs to use it, there's a board that, that's to be formed. I'm the director supposed to form the board. And uh, it's made up of service organizations, representatives from service organizations that decide how much should be drawn down annually from that account to be used to offset the maintenance cost of the cemeteries. That's where the other one third goes. And that's the cash balance in that account. Thanks, uh, Senator Farron. Yeah, thank you, Senator Lakeen. And uh, again, appreciate the, the insight and look behind it, but that I, I see uh, we've got similar uh, drawdowns on this account with, with two or three other items on here. And my overall concern still goes back to, you know, we talk about marketing dollars and things we can curtail, which makes sense. Um, but then there's items where we have purposely tried to build some cash reserves and cash accounts um, to be able to take care of our veterans and, you know, and, future and everything going on. And to me, this feels like a little bit of, of uh, Robin Peter to pay Paul and I, I'm good on things that we can come back, but we, there was foresight put into establishing these accounts and be able to do that. So I, I, I'm just, uh, I won't be supporting this initiative either. Uh, Representative Tuttle. I'd agree with Senator Farron, uh, having uh, been involved with this committee for a number of years, I can remember when it was first instituted and uh, did the senator say we want to keep funding this and put it in the form of a motion? Is that correct, Senator? Uh, yeah, yes, if you'd like to, to make a motion, you can say that we'll uh, move this line out. Well, I, I would, I would, Mr. Chair, if it's appropriate. Yep. I'll second. We have a motion by Representative uh, Tuttle and seconded by Senator Farron to move this line out and to keep the, move this curtailment out, which would keep the funding hole. Is there any further discussion on this reference 129? Seeing none, uh, we will proceed to a roll call vote. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrite. Yes. Representative McCrite, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dalla. Yes. Representative Dalla, yes. 12 1. I'm um, excuse me, 12 0. Thank you, Karen. Um, 12 0, we'll move on to uh, reference 130. <clears throat>
Reference number 130 reduces funding by managing office professional services expenses within available resources. The justification statement indicates it's eliminating contracted temporary office associate in the in Augusta Cemetery, and it will put additional strain on cemetery office staff. Representative Tuttle. Uh, Representative, uh, you, we're, we're muted. Sorry. All right. How's that? There you go. You good? Well, I, I wanted to have uh, Mr. Richmond uh, comment on this because I know he mentioned it before and uh, something I had concerns about. So, David, if you could fill us in, I'd greatly appreciate it. Yes, Representative. Um, so we use a we use a temporary contractor uh, temp service um, in to augment our staff in Caribou and, and to, at times at Mount Vernon Road. So um, we, we've eliminated that temporary contract. So we're not getting the extra assistance this year. And our, our full-time staff are, are just are picking up the slack. And uh, to be honest with you, where most everyone is working remotely, Except for a few, few staff, uh, admin staff at the cemetery, uh, they've been able to manage the workload. What do you think, Senator Farron? Excuse me. Uh... Yep. Oh, trying to unmute there. Um, this is another one that just uh, I worry about setting the uh, the the table for going into the biennium budget. Um, with this piece and not knowing what it what it holds, I mean, none of us know exactly what the future holds, right? And and I do want to take my hat off to 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 Dave and his group and everybody else is trying to do the best in these times for the for the citizens of Maine. But I I have a hard time supporting this one just from the standpoint of what what the future holds. So I'll I'll be voting not to move this one in. Well, Mr. Chair, if it's in order, could I? move that it would be taken out and that we continue funding, if that's yep. in order. Yep, that's in order. A motion I'd by- may, I'd make that motion. Yep, motion by Representative Tuttle to move this line out, continue the funding in full. I'll second that. Uh, seconded by Senator Farron. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a, a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Shambo. Senator Shambo, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCright. Yes. Representative McCright, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. yes. Representative Kinney, yes. <laughs> Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dallas. Yes. Representative Dallas, yes. 12 0. Great. Thank you, Karen. So 12 0 and 130, we'll move to uh, reference 131. <clears throat> reference 131 reduces funding by reallocating office and other supplies expenses to allowable federal funding source. Um, this is another one from the federal fund plot allowance account. Senator Farron. Yeah, so on this one, typically, and I think we've got one down below when it comes to uh, office supplies and, and supply expenses, uh, managing corporate facilities, I'm usually all for cutting office supplies and some of those expenses. My bigger concern is, is where <laughs> Relocating the expenses from the plot allowance fund is, is more where the money's coming from, not what what is to offset. So, um, 
I, I don't want to support taking money from the plot allowance fund. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Tuttle. <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, Senator, I would uh, agree with <laughs> Senator Farron, and if it's appropriate, I would make a motion that we fund this and don't vote to uh, cut this at this time. Sure. That's I second that. Okay, we have a motion by Representative Tuttle, seconded by Senator Farron uh, to take this piece out and to keep it funded. Any discussion? I, I agree with the sentiments on plot allowance, especially. Um, seeing no discussion, we'll uh, proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dollis. Yes. Representative Dollis, yes. 12 0. Okay, 12 0. On item 131, we'll move to 132. Reference number 132 reduces funding by reallocating general operation expenses to an allowable federal funding source. Again, this is from the federal fund plot allowance account according to the justification statement. Great, so this is another plot allowance um, re, uh, reallocation. Uh, Representative Kinney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For reasons as we've discussed before, I move this item. I reference number one thirty-two out. We got a motion. To, motion to move it out in the second. Second. Was that Farron? Oh, Chris. I also okay. Sorry, I can only see like four boxes on the side. So Representative Kinney made the motion to move it out and seconded by Representative Chiazzo. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar, yes. 12 0. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> So 12 0 and 132, we'll go to 133. Reference number 133 reduces funding by managing the rental purchase agreements for a bulldozer, excavator, or other small groundskeeping equipment expenses within available resources. Um, according to the justification statement, quality of the grounds may suffer as maintenance efforts are curtailed. Thanks, Janet. Senator Farron. <clears throat> Yeah, so looking this one over and talking about it, so I'm going to take arrows right from my boss and everybody else because, you know, that's what Caterpillar <laughs> does is we do equipment. But uh, I think there's <laughs> other sources out there between what Dave explained with DOT and, 
and other sources out there that this is the type of curtailment, especially where we're in February right now and coming into the spring, that I would make a motion that we move reference 133 in. Second. Okay, motion to move it in by Senator Farron and seconded by Representative Kitty. Any further discussion? I agree with um, Senator Farron's analysis. I think we can find equipment, I think the uh, director said, from other agencies in the area. Representative Tuttle. <clears throat> Uh, Representative, we've got you on mute. Well, it's a story of my wife, Senator, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I had some concerns about this, but after the explanation I heard from Senator Fair, and I would hope that down the road, Dave, if uh, Commissioner Richmond, if we do have issues in this area, that you'll bring it back to the committee, David. Will do. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, we'll uh, proceed to a vote by roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yeah, yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Piazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. yes. Representative yes. Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar, yes. 12 0. Great. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> so 12 0 on 133. So we can move to item 134. Reference number 134 reduces funding by managing training and conferences within available resources. The justification statement indicates it will result in no management training, but this is only a minimal impact. Great, thank you, Janet. Uh, Senator Farron. Hey, no one likes conferences and training more than politicians, but uh, I think it's <laughs> those things that uh, we can do away with where we're at now. Uh, and this is another one of those ones that I will make a motion to reference 134 and move that into the containment. Great, a motion to move this one in by Senator Farron. Second. Seconded by Representative Kinney. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a roll call. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar, yes. 12-0. Thanks, Karen. <clears throat> Move to 135. Reference number 135 reduces funding by deferring the planned addition of a GPS feature to the cemetery gravesite locator system project. Um, the justification statement indicates the national gravesite locator lacks a GPS feature that this project would have provided. Thanks, Janet. So, Director, um, would this be something we can pick up in July? 
<clears throat> um, Senator, it is possible. It, we, it's, we just have the last uh, cemetery to index into the system and we have an individual working on it. Um, it's, it's possible. I think we could uh, handle it next year. Okay, but it, it's kind of an ongoing thing now or? Once they're in there, they're, it's really just adding the new GPS locations, um, which I think we could realistically contract um, for, for less than what we've, what we've been doing now. Uh, Representative Tuttle, did, uh, Senator Farron. <clears throat> Senator, you're on, uh, you're on mute, mute. sorry. I'm trying, yeah. Usually I, uh, yeah, <laughs> talk in the background. Hey, I'd just like to reach out to our, to our co-chair, to Representative Cadazzo, and just get his, his thoughts on this as well, if he wouldn't mind sharing that with the committee. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess my concern would only my concern would be if we're going to drop it on the floor. Um, if it's something that can be temporarily postponed, I think that's fine. Um, I'd hate to have us be three out of four cemeteries and have one left hanging out there. I don't think that's realistic or fair, even though it happens to be the largest one. Um, so if you know, as long as Mr. Richmond says we can, you know, we can revisit this, you know, certainly in the biennial, um, I think we we can. Um, we could probably let this one go for now, but we'll make it an emphasis on the biennial for sure. Thank, thank you. Re uh, Representative Tuttle. Oh. Well, I, I think that uh, uh, chair, uh, House Chair uh, uh, expressed my concern to something that uh, I plan on keeping an eye on. And uh, I, I just want to discourage uh, uh, particularly a uh, any uh, any any instances where uh, we're going to delay uh, uh, burials for families uh, for months, and I'm um, hoping that we can make sure that doesn't happen in the near future. Uh, Senator Farron. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we move uh, reference 135 that we move it in. Okay, a motion to move it in by Second. Senator Farron, seconded by Representative Kinney. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll uh, proceed to a roll call vote. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Senator Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dolliff. Yes. Representative Dolliff, yes. 12 0. Great. Thank you, Karen. So 12 0 on 135. So we'll go to item 136. Reference number 136 reduces funding by managing maintenance expenses for cemetery equipment and vehicles within available resources. The justification statement indicates that the quality of the grounds may suffer as maintenance efforts are curtailed. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Representative Kinney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as a farmer with lots of heavy equipment on my farm, I recognize the importance of maintenance on that type of thing. It's a lot cheaper to just do regular maintenance than it is to try to replace broken parts. Um, believe me, I've done that many times. Um, and so I make a motion to move this out. Second. We had a motion to move it out by Representative Kinney, seconded by Representative uh, Corey. Your name reversed again. <laughs> uh, Representative Tuttle. Well, I was going to go second before uh, Representative Corey, but he beat me to it. <laughs> 
All right, any further discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Piazzo. Yes. Representative Piazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Representative Wood. Sorry, yes. There you are. Gotcha. <laughs> Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney, yes. yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dallas, yes. Representative Dallas, yes. 12 0. Great, thank you. So 137. Reference number 137 reduces funding to reflect projected annual actual expenses for the Caribou Cemetery security system. The justification statement indicates that the system has been replaced and the current contract will not be renewed. Great, thank you, Janet. Uh, Senator Farron. <clears throat> yeah, I think the justification says this pretty, pretty nicely. It's already been replaced and the contract's not gonna be re renewed. So I make a motion that we move Reference item number 137 in. Second. Great, motion to move it in by Senator Farron and seconded by Representative Corey. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. yes. Representative yes. Kinney, yes. yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dallas, yes. Representative Dallas, yes. 12 0. Great. Thank you, Karen. So we'll go to item 138. Reference number 138 reduces funding by reallocating office and other supply expenses to an allowable other special revenue funding source. The justification statement indicates that the initiative will have no impact as the underutilized other special revenue veteran services account can absorb these expenses. Thank you, Janet. <clears throat> Uh, Senator Farron. Yeah, I, I make a motion that we move uh, reference item number 138 in. Second. So we have a motion to move it in by Senator Farron and seconded by Representative uh, Corey. We got you again, Senator uh, Representative Tuttle. Any I'm further? I'm getting up slow on the draw here, Senator. <laughs> I'm sort of losing it in my old age. No. Any further discussion? Senator Farron, did you have discussion or is that it? Okay. All right, seeing none. No, I just didn't know how to lower my hand. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator 
Farron. Yes. Senator Farron. Yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Dolliff. Yes. Representative Dolliff. Yes. 12 0. Thanks. So 12 0 138. We'll move to item 139, which I believe is our final item. Reference number 139 reduces funding by managing staff training expenses within available resources. The justification statement indicates that the initiative will result in no learning opportunities for staff. Thanks, Janet. Senator Farron. Yeah, this is this is one of those things I think that we do have to take a look at from the <coughs> standpoint and, and stepping up and don't want to take any training uh, opportunities away from from the staff but I think this is something that uh, you have to do and so I'm going to make a motion that we reference we move in reference item 139. Second. Motion to move it in by Senator Farron and seconded by Representative Kinney. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none we'll proceed to a vote. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator DeChambeau. Senator DeChambeau, absent. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Senator McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Yes. Representative Tuttle, yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, Wood. Yes. 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 Representative, Representative Kinney. Kinney. Yes. yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Harrington, yes. Representative Corey. Yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dolliff. Yes. Representative Dolliff, yes. 12 0. Great. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> and thank you, Janet, for sharing that screen. Uh, so that is the final um, item <clears throat> for that part of the report back. Um, Janet will put together a letter uh, from the committee. And director, thanks for being here. Thanks for all the time you've given us over the past couple of weeks on this and for your willingness to kind of find ways to, to find money, you know, and uh, you're willing to take part of it. We just, we know you guys do an amazing work with a small staff and we just want to make sure you stayed, you know, hopefully we can keep as much resources there as we can. So Chairman well, Chiazzo. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll defer to Senator Farron. I think his hand was up first. My bad. No, no, you're good. Hey, uh, say, echo the same thing and I, and to what, what that crew does. But I also want to make a point, right, that we just voted all of these out with a 12 to nothing report. And our representative, Corey Patrick, that's on AFA. <laughs> he should be going back with the weight of the VLA about how we uh, – we all came together on this and had this discussion. I take my hats off to the to, to what Karen and Janet put together and Dave and what our co-chairs have done to do that. So thanks to the entire team. I don't remember voting on any of that stuff, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> it's all on you now, Representative Corey. No pressure. Senator exactly. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, v and VLA uh, members, I just want to say uh, I appreciate the sensitivity and the thoughtfulness you put into each of these votes. Uh, I, I really do. I didn't think I was going to have to argue so hard to give money back, but <laughs> I, I appreciate I appreciate what you're doing here. Thank you, well, sir. David, Chair, David, Chairman Chairman Chiazzo. Oh, sorry. 
No, that's okay. I, I just, yeah, I, I want to just echo everybody's sentiments, um, Director Richmond, and, and I don't want any, you know, I don't want this to be misconstrued as we don't trust or agree with any of the work that you guys did. You guys did a Herculean effort for sure. Um, and it's more, I think, I think Senator Farron spelled it out very nicely. It's, it's, we all know, uh, you know, on appropriations, you have to, you have to fight for everything you get. And once you get it, you got to protect it. So um, certainly no reflection on the great work you or your team has done. And, uh, um, you know, and we'll, 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 we'll come back at it again for the biennial and make sure we can, we can uh, hopefully strengthen up some of those positions as well. The chairs still need to come up in front of appropriations and put in the good fight though. So you guys better be prepared. <laughs> Sometimes we just send a letter. You just send the letter. <laughs> no, we pop down there. Uh, Representative Tuttle. Well, ditto. Uh, I think Dave Richmond, I've known him and worked with him for, I would say, David, over a decade, if not longer. And uh, you do a great service to the people of the state of Maine. And uh, a lot of times you don't get credit for it. But I, I know that working with you and our cemetery in Southern Maine, we couldn't have done it without you and uh, just keep up the good work. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Director. So I guess the last <clears throat> item on our agenda today is uh, kind of an informational presentation by, by our analyst, Janet, on the on liquor laws in Maine um, as kind of a little bit of background information before we start dealing with those bills. Um, as we've talked about, we have a really broad range of topics. And so it can be helpful to understand um, the way our li liquor system is uh, structured. And, you know, it's an interesting, you know, we're one of I think 18 control states. So it is a bit different uh, and different on the type of alcohol and, and different than some other states. So thanks, Jana, for putting together and, and turn it over to you. Certainly, I think I'll share my screen again. <clears throat> but first I have to call the right thing up, one sec. <laughs> Try again. Hopefully you're seeing a sub page of our committee materials page, is that working? Yep. yep. Okay, so just so you know, I'm gonna leave these posted. These, did somebody say no? Oh, no, I just think I'll hit, yeah, I think we got one came off mute, yeah. Okay, uh, I just want you to know that on this orientation materials page, these documents will stay posted in case you wanna revisit them in the future. Um, if you see typos or anything, just let me know. A couple of people have already told me about typos that have hopefully been fixed, um, but this is meant to be helpful and not something you need to memorize. There's no quiz after today. <laughs> So um, I was asked to present on three topics, the three tier system, spirits pricing in Maine and Maine liquor taxes. But last um, session was my first time with the VLA committee. So the last two years, and a lot of these terms didn't make any sense to me. So I wouldn't have been able to understand a presentation if I didn't know what the terms meant. So there's just a one page handout here that just gives you some background on what is liquor. Um, and the director, Director Minio alluded to this earlier, people think of liquor um, and they think of what we call spirits in Maine law. So <clears throat> just so that you know, this handout lets you know that liquor as that term is used in the statutes means spirits, wine, malt liquor, which you might think of as beer and low alcohol spirits products, as long as they have more than a half of a percent of alcohol by volume. Spirits have more than 8% alcohol by volume and they're produced by distillation, or they could be mixtures of things, including spirits produced by distillation. Um, on this chart, I also tell you who is responsible under Maine law, if you're a Maine manufacturer for manufacturing these products. There are also bottlers, but I didn't list those separately. Um, wine is less than or equal to 24% of alcohol by volume, and it's produced by fermenting fruit and other agricultural products. <clears throat> the reason this is worth mentioning is that hard cider is often thought of in a category like beer, which is something called malt liquor in Maine. And in Maine law, hard cider, which is discussed down here, is actually sold by malt liquor retailers. So if you're a retailer that has a license to sell malt liquor, 
which again, I'm gonna remind you is beer, then you would also be able to sell hard cider. But what might you might not realize is if you want the license to make hard cider, you have to be a winery because hard cider is technically wine since it's made by fermentation of apples and pears, which are agricultural products or fruits. Um, fortified wine is a special kind of wine. It has more than 15.5% alcohol by volume. So it's wine in between that amount and the 24% max for wine, or it's something that includes both wine and spirits. Malt liquor, as I've said before, is um, beer, ale, porter, and stout. Please do not ask, ask me the difference between these because I drink very little things that are listed on this page at all. It's often a joke in the committee and that's fine, you can laugh. Um, low alcohol spirits are spirits that have less than 8% alcohol. So if you remember, I told you the word spirits in the statute is more than 8%. Don't think that that means anything less than 8% isn't regulated. It's just regulated under a different category called low alcohol spirits products. Just to be helpful, if the low alcohol spirits product is including both wine and spirits, it's also called fortified wine. This you don't need to remember now, but this type of thing may come up in the future. All I am doing today is letting you know you can find the answers to these questions by looking at this handout. I'm not asking you to memorize it. Um, and then I go through on the bottom, the difference between different authorities given under Title 28A, there are certificates of approval, there are licenses, then helpfully there's the phrase certificate of approval holder, which includes both certificates of approval and some licenses. And then there's agency liquor stores, which this is very important for today. Agency liquor stores are the only retailers licensed in Maine for the off-premises sale of spirits they also sell wine and malt liquor, but they're the only entities that have licenses to sell spirits for off-premises consumption. And if they have an additional license, they can be a reselling agent and they would then sell those, be able to sell spirits to on-premises retailers. But again, this is not a memorization thing. This is just a handy reference, hopefully handy to you, reference page for the future. But now for the actual presentation, that was just the prelude. So the um, first topic I was asked to address today is the three-tier system of liquor distribution in Maine. And I'm gonna actually unzoom this a little. I'm sorry if it's a little small. I don't know why it does this on my page. Can't see quite all of the bottom of this three tiers, but there are three different tiers that um, Maine law treats differently. Tier one are man manufacturers and importers of um, alcohol into Maine. Tier two are wholesalers and tier three are retailers. And I put lines right in between them because the law treats these three types of entities differently. It sets it up as a tiered structure so that the wholesalers are meant to be the buffer between the manufacturers and importers of different types of liquor and the retailers of different types of liquor in Maine. There's also a big line down the middle of the page because Maine treats spirits differently than it treats wine and malt liquor. Maine has a model or type of a control state model over spirits, and it doesn't have that type of control state model over wine and malt liquor. And the reason I use model there is as Director Minio referred to during his agency briefing, control states all have slightly different ways of controlling the sale of, a, of different types of liquor products in their state. And, um, this chart outlines our model for spirits, but if you hear of another control state existing, it may have a slightly different model. So don't think that this chart tells you how something is sold in another state. This is just being limited to Maine. So right. anything- Janet, oh, Sorry, I was just gonna say, this is, this is like what we hear all the time when we're doing bills is people talking about three tiers and what each of the tier is. And we get bills from each part of the tier. So that's pretty helpful. This, this is really helpful just to, to understand what they're talking about uh, when they talk about this stuff. Well, I hope it's helpful. And if not, just ask questions or tell me to start over because I'm happy to do that. And I don't mean start over today. I mean, I can start over with a new handout, that's fine. Um, so anything in red is intended to sort of highlight to you the control state nature of the process. So we'll go through spirits on the left-hand side first. So tier one, as I said before, are your manufacturers and porters. 
So any licensed main manufacturer of spirits, those are distilleries or small distilleries, they're rectifiers, rectifiers mix spirits with other types of, I don't know, other substances. I, I don't work as a rectifier, so I can't guarantee exactly what they mix it with, hopefully liquids. Um, and there's also bottlers. There are all different types of manufacturers that can be licensed to produce spirits for the market in Maine. Also, anyone who supplies spirits to the market for Maine, but is from out of state, so they're an importer, they have to have a certificate of approval in order to introduce their spirits into the Maine market. And those could be out of state manufacturers or out of state distributors. Distributor is just a loose term I'm using for someone who doesn't themselves manufacture the spirits, but buys them from a manufacturer or someone along the supply chain and then resells them for the market in Maine. The state is the tier two entity. So the state is the wholesaler. So the state sorry, purchases. Oh. Sorry, uh, Jeremy Chiazzo has a question. Sorry, sorry, Jen, I didn't want to interrupt you. I want to let you go a little second. Um, I, I'm just sorry. wondering, does uh, we say out of state, what about international? Do they just, out of state just means anybody outside of Maine. It's not just, continental US, right? So that's what I mean from this slide. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Good question. Okay. I, it used, well, it may still throughout the statute say foreign sometimes, and that's supposed to be out of state and other countries, but every once in a while, foreign just means out of the country. So this is the type of thing that the very large errors liquors bill tries to clear up what, what is out of state. So anywhere that's not in Maine and what is actually foreign. But gotcha, okay. for this purposes, I just mean non-Maine, okay. anywhere Thank that's you. not Maine. So the state is the tier two wholesaler. The state actually purchases all spirits that will eventually be sold to Maine consumers. The state contracts with Pine State Spirits, that's a business entity, for warehouse distribution and marketing services. And I'll get a little bit more into that when I talk about spirits pricing to get a little bit more into what exactly those contracts cover. But it, that's the most important thing to remember in this control state model. The state actually buys all of the spirits as the wholesaler and then um, all of the spirits that will be eventually be sold in Maine. So tier three are your retailers. We have licensed agency liquor stores. If you remember from the earlier handout I discussed, they are the only entities licensed for off-premises sales of spirits in Maine they must purchase spirits that they're going to sell in the state from the state at a wholesale price that is set by the state. So again, that's in red because that's a control state model. That's the state exerting control over the spirits market. Licensed agency liquor stores then resell those spirits to consumers for off-premises consumption at a retail price that is also set by the state. We're gonna get into that more in the spirits pricing handout. There are also licensed on-premises retailers. You might think of as um, people commonly call them bars and restaurants. You may be interested to know the word bar is not involved in Title 28A. That's not a licensed category, but restaurants is. There's actually a couple of kinds of restaurants just for fun. Um, but these on-premises retailers have to purchase spirits from specially licensed agency liquor stores called reselling agents, and they have to purchase them at the retail price set by the state. They can then sell these spirits to consumers for on-premises consumption at whatever price they choose. And of course, now that I have to speak, I haven't coughed all day, I'm gonna cough, so I'm gonna mute myself for a second. I'm just gonna point out real quick, this is way more complicated than marijuana. <laughs> yeah, you probably heard references to this the whole time you guys were all doing the marijuana committee, weren't you? About the oh three tier liquors, they, they all would have died. <laughs> would have Patrick, Patrick, not yet, right? <laughs> and it's so different from spirits to beer and wine. It's it's amazing. Thank you for that distraction. I really appreciate that, Representative Corey. You made I understand the, the dairy tier. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so just by contrast, for wine and malt liquor. Tier one, your manufacturers and importers are still your licensed main manufacturers. There's wineries, there's a, a small winery category, breweries, a small brewery category are bottlers. And again, anyone who imports wine or malt liquor into the state is part of this tier. 
and they have to have a certificate of approval. So they're out of state breweries or wineries or out of state wholesalers. Um, wholesalers, the term used in the malt, liquor and wine industry for entities that might purchase it from a manufacturer for resale later on down the chain. Tier two are your wholesalers. And in Maine, they have to be licensed wholesalers. And even though they're licensed wholesalers, they're referred to in the statute as wholesale licensees. So that's the phrase I use here. They purchase from tier one entities, all wine and malt liquor that will eventually be sold to Maine consumers by the tier three entities. And even though the state is not the wholesaler, so we don't, this is not sort of a control state model, it is important to understand that the relationship between the tier one and tier two entities is highly regulated in Title 28A. There are a lot of statutes about the contracts between wholesale licensees and the um, manufacturers or importers that provide them products. So it's not a completely unregulated market is my point there. Tier three are your retailers. They could be licensed off-premises retailers. They have to purchase wine and malt liquor from wholesale licensees. The retailer can then set the price at which it's going to resell those products to consumers for off-premises consumption. Same exact um, concept for on-premises retailers. They have to purchase from licensed wholesale licensees and they can set their own price. So there's no state control of the wholesale or resale price here. So again, the red shows you the difference between spirits, wine and malt liquor. So just remember there's these three separate layers, manufacturers, importers, wholesalers, and then retailers. The three tier system has two important prohibitions. Entities within one tier of this system may not have a financial interest in or have the same officers or directors as entities within a different tier of the system. So the idea is that there's no control or ownership between tiers. In addition, the other major prohibition is that entities in one tier cannot engage in the activities of entities in another tier of the system. For example, a manufacturer may not sell directly to a retailer and a manufacturer or wholesaler may not sell directly to a consumer. Those are the basic three tier system prohibitions. You may notice in this presentation, I've given you no reasons why, because that's not my job. That's your job to decide reasons why. But um, as was mentioned during the um, Bureau of Alcoholic Beverages and Lottery Operations Agency presentation, their briefing to you, um, we are members of the National Alcoholic Beverage Control Association or NABCA, N-A-B-C-A. If you do a quick Google search for them, they do have plenty of information explaining why um, control states have that model and gives you the history after prohibition and all of that. That did not seem like a comfortable thing for me to discuss. I'm not your why person. I'm your person who tells you what the law says. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. And um, uh, Chairman Chiazzo has a question. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, so, Jan, I've got a, a constituent that 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 works as a quote unquote consultant, I guess, for an out of state winery, and they do direct purchase over the internet, I guess, or something. Is that that legal? is beautiful? It's a beautiful question because this introduces my exceptions to the okay. prohibitions of the three tier <laughs> okay. system. You can, were just ahead of the class and already on the next page of the handout. Can we, um, did you have a question to represent Corey or, sorry, yep. No, I was just wondering on that website if there was an easy to follow cartoon for <laughs> us. Uh... <laughs> there may be, they had some really old pictures of prohibition and things. Um, so remember it's the financial interest prohibition, no control of different entities in the other tiers. And also you can't engage in the activities of another tier, but as Representative Caso pointed out, sometimes they do, but they have to be statutorily allowed. So the statutory exceptions or some of them are minor investments. Entities within one tier of the three tier system may have minor investments in less than 1% of the securities of an entity within another tier of the three tier system. This we refer to sometimes as a de minimis investment, which the only reason I said that was because Representative McCrate told me she liked de minimis last year. Um, another exception are off-premises sales by main manufacturers. So if you remember, manufacturers are in the top tier and sales 
to consumers are done by retailers in tier three, so that should not ordinarily be allowed. But our statutes do allow main manufacturers at their production facilities to sell their products directly to consumers for off-premises consumption. It's important to note that we're still a control state model for spirits. So the state is still technically the wholesaler, does technically take title to those spirits and buy them before they're resold at the production facility to the consumer. Um, sometimes the bottle actually physically goes to the state warehouse and comes back. Sometimes it doesn't, but the state is still technically the wholesaler, even in those um, sales at distilleries. Um, but the point is normally manufacturers can't sell directly to consumers. And there is this statutory exception for main manufacturers at their production facilities. In addition, small wineries and small distilleries under the statute are allowed to make sales for off-premises consumption at two additional facilities beyond their production facility. So each license allows um, for a small winery or a small distillery only, each license allows both sales at the, the production facility and two additional facilities. They don't need to have them, but they're allowed to. There is also a statutory exception allowing on-premises sales to consumers by main manufacturers. So they may obtain something that you'll see constantly referred to or hear constantly referred to as a chapter 43 license. That's a license to sell liquor for on-premises consumption, commonly referred to in the media as a restaurant or bar. Um, but there are many, many different categories including bowling centers and curling centers, for example. So main manufacturers can obtain one chapter 43 license per production facility to sell liquor to directly to consumers for on-premises consumption. When they obtain this license, they're just like any other chapter 43 licensed on-premises retailer. So they can sell both their own products and other products. It's not just their own products. That's a difference from the off-premises sales where they can only sell their own products. Another exception is that small breweries and small wineries are allowed directly to sell their products to retailers. They do not have to go through wholesale licensees, although they are allowed to use wholesale licensees. So this was something that came up in some bills um, in the 129th. So it's an exception some of you may be very familiar with, but it is a difference because ordinarily they would be required to go through the wholesale licensee. You'll note that small distilleries are not listed here because they do always have to go through the state Technically, the state always buys the product before it's resold to a customer. And then here's what Representative Kyazo was referring to. There are wine direct shipper permits. I wrote permit, but it's actually a license. So a winery or a small winery located in Maine or another state may obtain a direct shipper license to sell, sell and ship its own products directly to consumers in Maine. If you want to know why is that something we allow both Maine and other states, I wasn't here when it happened, but there is um, US Supreme Court case law saying if you let mine, Maine wineries do it, you have to let out of state wineries do it too. Does anyone have any other questions about these three tiers? Just, just real quick, Janet, sorry. Um, does a tasting room fall under a uh, chapter 43 license or is that something separate? So the tasting room could be the way that it's um, getting you to buy for off-premise consumption, or it could be a way of encouraging you to use the um, chapter 43 licensee and go to their restaurant or bar associated. But tasting rooms are allowed and it just depends on exactly whether they have a chapter 43 license attached or not. But um, the statute governing main manufacturers specifically allows the offering of samples. So they don't have to have that chapter 43 license to allow it because they are specifically under a separate provision of the statute allow to offer samples either for free or for sale. Yeah, because we heard a lot about tasting rooms with the executive orders. And as Janet said, it's, you can do it just under the privilege of a manufacturing license. And those were the ones that are kind of in the position where they're closed now because the people who have chapter 43 restaurants are able to open. But if you just have a tasting room that's in your manufacturing facility, um, that's just utilizing the ability to sell or give out samples, that those were some that were affected by the executive orders. 
is is there a, a hard and fast criteria, whether it's volume or samples offered between a chapter 43 non-official bar versus a tasting room? How do you differentiate between what qualifies for what? Well, I think like a tasting room is not defined in law, but when people talk about tasting rooms often, it's just from the manufacturing facility, I think, because it's not really written in the law. It's hard to find the exact reason, but mm -hmm. a lot of people, when they say tasting rooms, it's just the, the ability to give or sell samples from a manufacturing facility. Is that accurate, Janet? Sorry. It is. There, um, if you it's look- It's just hard where we don't define it, so it's hard to ask Janet that question. <laughs> it's more what we talk about. <clears throat> right, right, so there isn't a definition of tasting room. It does allow for samples in the main manufacturing statute. Um, it's interesting that you ask how, what's the volume? If you really like charts, which I know not everybody does. And if you look under the 129th BLA committee materials, there is a chart there that shows that some of the, there's many different taste testing provisions throughout Title 28A, which is the main liquor laws. Some of those taste testing provisions have sample size limitations, some do not. And the ones that do have sample size limitations, they don't match each other. So it's a very interesting read. It was, um, we, we keep alluding to the errors bill, which does address some of the inconsistencies within the title, but it doesn't get to that particular inconsistency that was just more than the subcommittee that worked on it could bite off for that project. But there isn't a sample size indicator in the main manufacturing statute, so it's not defined. Representative Corey? Yes, I feel like we would have to visit some of these places to better understand this. I think you're exactly right. <laughs> I'm not sure I can comment somewhere. on that. Yeah, maybe it, if it weren't for COVID, we would have a committee trip scheduled. Okay, so moving on to spirits pricing in Maine. This looks daunting, but I promise I can try and explain it and you can ask me any questions you want and you do not need to memorize it. This is more of a background information so that in the back of your mind, you have an idea of how the spirits prices are set. And then in the future, when it comes up in bills, if it does, we can talk about it more then. So again, no quizzes or tests today. But right, if you're visibly falling asleep, on the video, I might have my feelings for it. So <laughs> and this is relevant on. because the liquor revenues are gonna be pretty relevant this session. So I know in budget talks, so this is really helpful. Okay, so spirits pricing in Maine. Um, if you were on the committee before, we talked about this a little bit before. Um, this handout has been revised slightly, mostly by increasing the font size because I tend to hand out things that have really small fonts so I can cram a lot on one page. And if you're looking at this and thinking that is cramming a lot, then you haven't met me very much. So the retail price of spirits is the price paid by a consumer who purchases spirits for off-premises consumption from an agency liquor store. It's also the price that a main distillery, uh, um, excuse me, it's also the price that an on-premises retailer, so your restaurant or bar, who purchases spirits from a reselling agent um, pays when they're going to buy those spirits for resale to consumers. So the retail price is what you pay to the agency liquor store, either because you're an individual consumer who walks in or because you want to stock your shelves and you're an on-premises retailer. Under statute, now these are blue because they're hyperlinked, but when they're also underlined, I find it very distracting. So I took the underlining out, but if you see something blue here, you can just click on it when you look at this on your own and you can look directly at the statute if you feel like it. But under the statute, the retail price is established by the State Liquor and Lottery Commission and they base that retail price on a recommendation from the Bureau or BABLO. The retail price I've, I've learned from BABLO itself is set using a pricing formula that considers the type of spirits, the product size and whether the product was manufactured in Maine by statute, that retail price that they set using the pricing formula has to be to sufficient to cover the cost paid by the state to purchase the spirits product from the supplier. So remember the main, main is the wholesaler, it buys all spirits from the supplier, those manufacturers or importers before they're resold in Maine. So this our retail price has to obviously be sufficient to cover the state cost in purchasing the product. 
Number two, it also has to be sufficient to cover the profit that the agency liquor store will get when it sells the product um, either to consumers directly for off-premises consumption or when it sells it to the on-premises retailers. And in addition, under item three, the retail price has to be sufficient to cover the state spirits tax, which is called the consumer tax in statute. And that amount has to be sufficient to pay for the Bureau spirit related administrative expenses. So those are personnel costs or contract fees paid to Pine State Spirits under the Spirits Administration and Marketing Contracts, which I'll discuss on the next page. In addition, that consumer's tax includes payments to the Liquor Operation Revenue Fund in the Maine Municipal Bond Bank, and that has been used to pay off hospital bond debt, and it is, can be used for a few more purposes, which I'll discuss in a second. Well, not a second, more like a couple minutes. And then also, this consumer's tax has to be sufficient to cover a different tax called a premium tax, which is $1.25 per proof gallon that is paid to the general fund for substance use disorder prevention and treatment services out of the Department of Health and Human Services. So the Bureau's administrative expenses, the main municipal bond bank payments, and this premium tax for substance use disorder prevention, all of those are wrapped up into the spirits tax. That plus the agency liquor store profit plus the Bureau's, I mean, excuse me, plus the Bureau's cost to buy the product, all of those have to be covered by the retail price. Uh, After, Rep yep. Representative uh, Tuttle has a question. <clears throat> yes, sir. Well, pertaining to the <laughs> premium tax and the other taxes, do we uh, know, have they been changed over the years and when was the last time it was done? Because I think it would be helpful the committee uh, uh, care if, if you don't know what it is but I I would like to I think that when we're talking about uh, upcoming funding sources I think it would be helpful to the committee so if we could get those answers either today or in the near future it'd be helpful for me so I don't know um, all of the details but the premium tax is here in 1703. And this $1.25 was last amended in 1987. It looks like it's actually when it was introduced. In 2013, it looks like some other things were taken out. So I can yep, look to see what those yep. were. Um, but if you, uh, sorry, that was earlier. And, and often those bills here, will get sent down to the taxation committee when they mess around with the tax rates, just as we've seen before. But, but this... Yeah, state Chair, spirits please check tax with or consumers tax, it's not a set amount. So that's what you, it, you need to remember. It's not a set amount. It's built into the pricing formula that they use to generate the retail price. Um, because what it is, is the administrative expenses, the contract fees, it has to be sufficient money for the liquor or revenue, operation revenue fund. So it's not as if it's a certain percentage amount. It's just that when they set the price, they have to make sure all of these items are covered. So I don't know how much exactly it is as a percentage, and I imagine it slightly differs depending on whether it's the type of spirits or the product size, et cetera, and so forth. Well, we could check with Bablo, like Mr. Chair, and maybe update some of that stuff, because I think it would be helpful for all of us, including the new members of the committee like myself. I can definitely update you on the premium tax and Bablo well, they didn't approve all this language, but they've seen all this language and they haven't strenuously objected to any of it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I promise not to interrupt you until tomorrow. <laughs> you can interrupt me all you want because this is not helpful if you don't get to ask your questions. Then I might as well just be a talking head. So the wholesale price of spirits. So it seems odd that the retail price would be set first, but that was something I learned um, in the 129th legislature that the State Liquor and Lottery Commission sets the retail price and then the Bureau figures out the wholesale price. So the wholesale price is the price paid by an off-premises retailer when it purchases spirits from the state for resale to consumers and on-premises retailers. So this is the price usually paid by an agency liquor store to buy the spirits from the state that it's then gonna sell down the line. Um, under the statutes, the Bureau establishes the whole wholesale price of spirits as a certain percentage discount off of the retail price that the Liquor and Lottery Commission has established. 
So this discount rate or percentage off of the retail price represents the profit that the off-premises retailer earns when it sells spirits to a consumer, which makes sense because your retail price subtracting your wholesale price is gonna be your profit. So whatever discount they have off of the retail price is gonna represent the profit that they're gonna make when they sell that product. So under statute, the minimum discount rate for spirits sold by agency liquor stores is 12% off of the retail price, but the Bureau has authority under statute to establish graduated discount rates above that 12%. So the minimum profit that an agency liquor store will make is 12% off of the retail price. By rule, the Bureau has established two minimum discount rates based on the the total price of the product, so 12% for spirits with a retail price less than or equal to $24.99, and a little bit higher or 14% for spirits with a higher retail price. The rules also include a couple of growth incentive programs for agency liquor stores that can lead to higher discount rates. Effective July 1st, 2020, the two discount rates, so depending on the retail price of the product, are 16% and 18%. So if you're an agency liquor store and you purchase spirits from the state that you're later going to sell to people who walk in off the street to buy them or to restaurants and other on-premises retailers, if you have the license to do so, then you get a discount of 16% off of the retail price that you get to make as profit for any spirits product less than $24.99. And you get a profit or 18% discount rate. Um, off of any spirits product that costs more than $25. And if that doesn't make sense to you, we have in fact an example with the calculations um, that I'll show you in a little bit. There is uh, a separate, oh, sorry. go ahead. Representative Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Janet, is there anything preventing a retail liquor store for selling at a loss? Can they discount their prices so low that that is it but they have a they have a, a floor i assume they can't go below a floor right they they don't have a floor or a ceiling they have an exact price they have to sell at the retail okay. price set by the state okay yeah the the price will be the same at every agency store across the entire state of maine and remember okay. we're just discussing spirits so if you more regularly purchase malt liquor <laughs> or wine and you see different prices in different stores, you might think that I'm full of baloney and making this up. We're just talking about spirits right now. Okay. I am okay. often full Thank of baloney, but I'm not making this up. I actually don't eat baloney, so I'm not full of it. Um, so that's the discount rate for agency liquor stores. The current, there's two discount rates. There's 16% and 18%. In the 129th legislature, there was a bill specifically directed at Maine small distilleries that smell, it's not smell, that sell their products directly to consumers. And out of that bill came a new statutory discount rate of 22.75% for Maine small distilleries. It's worth noting here that if you remember, the state is the wholesaler for all spirits products in the state. So if you're a Maine small distillery and you make a product you have to technically sell it to the state before you can sell it to a consumer in your tasting room um, or at your production facility. Maine small distilleries under the statute aren't actually required to ship that bottle of product to the warehouse and then have it shipped back to them. I think that was used um, and discussed as some of the justification for this higher discount rate or profit to the Maine small distillery because it was using less of the state resources. But um, you would have to talk to people who are on the committee to get more information on precisely why they voted for it, but that was discussed as part of the reason. If you're a large distillery, you still have to physically send the bottle back and forth so they're not covered by this increased discount rate or increased profit. So you may be wondering about the Sp Spirits Administration and Marketing contracts. This is something Representative Tuttle has brought up before because the deadline is looming for when the contracts expire. So under a section of the, the title, the Bureau had to enter two 10-year contracts. After competitive bidding, both contracts were awarded to Pine State Trading Company doing business as Pine State Spirits for the term of July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2024. The first contract is the Spirits Administration contract. Under this contract, Pine State Spirits has to provide specific Spirits Administration services, including warehousing, twice weekly delivery service to agency liquor stores, 
establishment and maintenance of an IT system, bottle redemption services, financial administration services, et cetera. There are a lot of services in that contract. Pine State Spirits is compensated for this, these contractual services through payment of a services fee. So the services fee for the Spirits Administration contract is a set percentage of the total net sales and bailment revenue collected for spirits sold in Maine. So total net sales is revenue collected based on the wholesale price of products sold by the state to off-premises retailers. And bailment revenue is the amount that spirit suppliers are charged for certain warehouse services. So the original spirits administration services fee was 4.7% of those two amounts, the wholesale prices and the bailment revenue. And on July 25th, in July 2015, that was increased to 4.95%. So for its Spirits Administration contract services, Pine State Spirits receives 4.9% of any bailment revenues owed for um, by, by producers who keep their um, spirits in the warehouse and also of total net sales, which is the wholesale price of all products sold by the state to off-premises retailers. There is a second contract, however, it's the spirits marketing contract. So through that contract, Pine State Spirits has to provide specific trade marketing activities, including floor layout designs and implementation, point of sale marketing, off-shelf displays, store ads, flyers, circulators, et cetera. And Pine State Spirits is compensated for these services also through payments of a services fee. So the marketing contract services fee is 2.25% of total net sales. And this is the same percent that it's been since the beginning of the contract. So if you look, and I just hold it up here, total net sales, these are the wholesale price of products sold by the state to off-premises retailers. If you add up their fees under both contracts, Pine State Spirits get 7.2% of the wholesale price, and the state is left with the remaining 92.8%. For bailment, Revenue, which is money paid for the warehousing services, the storage in the warehouse, and it's paid by the manufacturers or importers. Um, this, the Pine State Spirits gets under its Spirits Administration contact 4.95% of this bailment revenue, and the rest, 95.05%, is for the state. Uh, Rep Janet? Representative Chiado. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, do, does the state own the physical facility of the warehouse? And, and Pine State manages it. So if we switch that contract around with the new licensee or the new, the new uh, vendor, would they have to build a new facility in order to be compliant? I do not know the answer to that question. Senator Lucchini may. Okay. Yeah, um, Pine, yes, State owns would. Their facility. Pine State owns their facility and their trucks and everything. So that would be part of the RFP would be they'd have to demonstrate their capacity to have a warehouse in trucking to supply the 600 plus agency stores. Gotcha, okay, thank you. So if we recap and look at it again, remember the state is the wholesaler. So the state sells all the pro spirits products that are gonna be sold in Maine at wholesale and retains 92.8% of those wholesale prices and it gets 95.05% of any bailment revenue generated by the warehouse. And a recap, where does that money go? I know this is review, but it's helpful at least for me to recap. That money has to go to suppliers for the cost of goods sold. And that's calculated. Um, this was language used during the Bureau's presentation. So depletions from the warehouse, what has been sold out of the warehouse, that's how you figure out the cost of goods sold, how many bottles have gone out of the warehouse for sale later on. That money also has to go to the administrative costs of the Bureau for personnel services and other expenses that are all related to spirits. It also has to go to the Liquor Operation Revenue Fund in the Maine Municipal Bond Bank to pay the hospital bond debt and ancillary costs. Just so you know, during the Bureau's presentation, it mentioned that it also sent money to some other departments. So it is worth noting that in the statute governing this liquor operation revenue fund in the main municipal bond bank, it does say if there is excess funds above the required bond payments in any year, up to $7 million can be used for revolving loan funds for drinking water systems. Those monies are funneled through the Department of Health and Human Services. It can go through revolving loans for wastewater treatment that goes through the Department of Environmental Protection. 
and highway bridge constructions through the Department of Transportation. So if you look back at the Bureau's agency briefing materials, it does detail what payments were made to those other departments using this money. And it all comes from the spirit sales. And again, it also goes to that premium tax, which we just discovered was established in 1985 or at least before then, that could be when the law was recodified. So it was at least existed since 1985, and that's money to be used for substance use disorder prevention and treatment services. So now that I've told you where all this money goes and all these discount rates, your head may be spinning, which mine was when I tried to learn all of this. So I wanted to give you some examples and hopefully they help. If they don't help, just don't listen to me for the next few minutes. So if you remember the retail price, which is set by the State Liquor and Lottery Commission is actually comprised of both the wholesale price and the discount rate. So the wholesale price is the cost of the product from the supplier plus the state spirits tax. And the discount rate is what's going to be the profit of the agency liquor store or the other off-premises retailer it might be, for example, a small distillery that does have that ability to sell directly to consumers. So how does this work? if a spirit is sold by an agency liquor store. So the example here is a 750 milliliter bottle of non-main made bourbon. I don't know what bourbon is, so please don't ask. The supplier price is what the out-of-state distillery is gonna charge the state when it wants to sell this bottle of bourbon and it sets that price because it's the supplier gets to set that price and let's say it sets it for $19. Then the State Liquor and Lottery Commission goes ahead and establishes the retail price using its pricing formula. And it says that bottle of bourbon is gonna sell for $33.99. That's gonna be the retail price set by the state. After the retail price, the Bureau calculates the wholesale price using the 18% discount rate, because this is gonna be more than $25. Remember there's 16% discount rate for agency liquor stores or an 18%. So this is more than $25 bottle, so it's going to be the 18% rate. If you actually do the calculation, an 18% discount off of the retail price is $6.12. That's the profit the agency liquor store makes when it sells the product to a consumer or an on-premises retailer. So if you subtract that $6.12 from the retail price, you're going to generate your wholesale price, which is $27.88. That's the price the agency liquor store pays the state when it buys that product for its shelves. Based on that wholesale price, if you do the calculations under the contracts, remember there was the percentage of total net sales, et cetera, Pine State Spirits received 72.2% of this wholesale price or $2.01, and the state receives $25.87 or 92.8% of that wholesale price. The state has to use that $25.87 to pay the distillery the $19 for the product because the state buys everything as the wholesaler in Maine. And then the $6.87 that are left can be used for the Babylon's administrative costs, the liquor operations revenue fund, and the premium tax. They're probably because this is an out-of-state made bourbon that's going to sit in the warehouse at least for some period of time. There might be some bailment revenue in the state and the Pine State Spirit to share that bailment revenue, but I figured there was enough detail here. I left that off here. Now let's compare that under um, the rubric made in the 129th legislature for Maine small distilleries that sell their products directly to consumers at their facilities. So we're still gonna have a 750 milliliter bottle of bourbon, but it's gonna be made in Maine by a small distillery. It's going to choose, it doesn't have to, but let's just for the purposes of this handout, say that it chooses to sell its product to the state for the same $19 supplier price. If you remember, I told you the retail price is set by the State Liquor and Lottery Commission. One of the things it considers in setting that price is whether the product was made in Maine. And because this product was made in Maine, the retail price is slightly lower. So it's $2 lower. It was $33.99 for an out-of-state bourbon. And it's going to be $31.99 because it's an in-state product. After that retail, not rice, but price is set, the Bureau calculates the wholesale price using the higher 22.75% discount rate that applies only to small distilleries that sell their products directly to consumers. So remember that the legislature in the last session decided to allow a higher profit rate for those small distilleries because they don't send their product through the system. 
So in this example, that 22.75% discount rate off of the retail price is $7.27 and is the profit for the small distillery that it gets out of the retail price. If you subtract that 727 from the retail price, you're gonna get this wholesale price, which is technically, although not, not actually paid by the small distillery to the state. So theoretically, the small distillery is selling this bottle to the state for $19 and then buying it back for $24.71. But the small distillery doesn't actually physically send that bottle of spirits to the state warehouse before selling it to the consumer. And instead it sends the state the difference between the supplier price and the wholesale price. So we pretend that it sold it for $19 and bought it for $24.71. And what it actually does is send the state $5.71 per bottle because the state is still technically the wholesaler and is involved in all the other services. So that's what the state gets out of this um, transaction. Based on this wholesale price, this wholesale price right here, Pine State Spirits receives 7.2%, which is $1.78, and the state receives the remaining $3.93 of the amount that the small distillery paid to purchase the bottle. And that $3.93 is applied to the Bureau's administrative costs and the Liquor Operations Revenue Fund. So the basic importance of this example is this higher discount rate allows the small distillery to make a higher profit and it does result in less money going to the state. In this case, $3.93 instead of $6.87 um, to be used for all of the things the state has to cover with this um, spirit's income. Now the Bureau, when they were commenting on this handout, because I did run everything by them to make sure nothing was inaccurate, did want to point out that this, all these calculations and where the money goes, the numbers are right, but they don't actually do their accounting system this way. They don't think of it as the state getting a share and Pine State getting a share. They think of it as contract revenues and things owed under the contract, but this is the way my mind works. So do understand that they might not use exactly that terminology for where the money goes, but where the money goes in these examples is accurate. It's just not the way they would describe it. Janet, we've got a question from Representative Tuttle. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Senator Keeney, the changes in the 129th legislature, could you recall the bill and why it was done, will we? For the small distillers? Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was my bill, actually. So it just since uh, small distillers basically make their located in Maine. So this is Maine based craft distilling. So since they make their own product, they basically take it from the distillery and put it on the shelf in their building and sell it. Um, we felt they deserved uh, a higher discount rate because they weren't sending it through the state system. They weren't uh, requiring Pine State to come pick it up and deliver it to, to stores. So this is a, it's kind of a, kind of a pro-business uh, incentive for Maine-based distilleries. Thank you. Yep. Do we have any more questions on that one? I know it's a big topic to, to go over really quickly, but hopefully if you look at this and then you can feel free to ask me any questions in the future, or if the topic comes up again, we can talk about it again. This is just sort of an introduction, get the ideas spinning in your mind. Can well, my mind you? is spinning, Karen. <laughs> Perfect. Janet. <laughs> I like Karen, so I do not mean mind being called her name. I think it's a compliment. Well, I promise to get that right. <laughs> so the last um, topic I was asked to discuss is main liquor taxes. And again, I put this in a chart, which is more for, I view it as a handy <laughs> reference. Again, not something that you need to memorize today. And if it's blue, it's hyperlinked. So for example, I thought somebody might ask me what's a proof gallon. If you click on that, it'll bring you to the federal government's um, explanation of what a proof gallon is and how you can calculate it. I would be terrible at explaining that sort of thing. And if you want to actually look at the statutes, you can see them here. So I was asked to tell you what kind of taxes apply to liquor. Um, in Maine, this is not corporate taxes or anything else. These are just liquor specific, either sales or excise taxes. 
So there is the state spirits tax. We talked about this already. So you should feel slightly comfortable maybe about the state spirits tax. And the amount of that has to be sufficient to cover the spirits related administrative expenses of the Bureau, including the contract fees paid to Pine State Spirits funding of the Liquor Operation Revenue Fund in the main municipal bank at a level equal to the funding in the previous year, and the premium tax of $1.25 per proof gallon, which goes to substance use disorder prevention and treatment. So if you remember, we achieved this state spirits tax, excise tax amount um, as a state by having the State Liquor Lottery Commission set the retail price of spirits at an amount that will be sufficient to cover this. So it's not as if you look and go and buy something off the shelf in an agency liquor store, and then you're paying on top of that some kind of excise tax. It's all built into what the retail price is. And it's all based on that pricing formula we talked about, which looks at the size of the bottle, the type of the product, and whether it was made in Maine or not. A little bit easier to wrap your head around perhaps is the wine excise tax. This excise tax is paid by a Maine manufacturer when it's selling its wine to a wholesale licensee because the wholesale licensee, remember, is the tier two entity that then resells the wine to Maine retailers. So if a Maine manufacturer is making a product that will ultimately be sold in Maine, then it's gonna be paying this excise tax. The wholesale licensee, if they're going to be purchasing products that are made outside of Maine and importing them into Maine, then they have to pay this excise tax. They also have to pay it when they offer products at certain taste testing festivals. If you're a wine direct shipper, which is what Representative Chiazza was referring to earlier, and you're selling and shipping wine directly to Maine consumers, then you're going to pay this excise tax. And there's an interesting little provision of the, the title that allows specific wine auction permits. So if you're going to be selling wine through an auction under one of these permits in Maine, then you're going to pay this excise tax. The excise tax varies slightly by the type of wine. So if it's sparkling wine, it's $1.24 a gallon. Fortified wine has that same price or that same tax rate. Hard cider has a 35 cent per gallon tax rate. And any other kind of wine that's not one of these three is a 60 cent per gallon tax rate. Remember this hard cider 35 cent because now we're gonna talk about malt liquor. Hard cider is often similarly treated to malt liquor. And here's an example. The malt liquor excise tax is also 35 cents per gallon. And again, this excise tax is paid by the Maine manufacturer if their product is eventually going to be sold in Maine, or it might be paid by the wholesale licensee, that middle tier entity when it's importing anything from out of state into Maine. So if it's going to be a product that's eventually sold in Maine, then it's a 35 cent per gallon excise tax. Then there are low alcohol spirits products. These actually have two excise taxes. So there's a $1.24 per gallon excise tax, which is similar to the ones we've talked about before. It's paid by the main manufacturer if it's low alcohol spirits product will eventually be sold in Maine, or it's paid by the wholesale licensee if it's importing those products into Maine for sale. There is a second low alcohol spirits products tax and the statute is clear that both have to be paid and it's 30 cents per gallon. And that is paid by the manufacturer either when selling their products to a wholesale licensee. So, sorry, it's paid either by a main or an out-of-state manufacturer at the point in time when they sell their products to a wholesale licensee. Remember a wholesale licensee is the entity in Maine that is allowed to sell um, malt liquor, wine or low alcohol spirits products to a retailer for sale to Maine residents. So both of these excise taxes have to be paid. Um, basically it's all the same products, all the same low alcohol spirits products are subject to these two taxes. It's just that in one case, the wholesale licensee pays it on imports. And in the other case, the statute says the out of state manufacturer pays it on imports. Whether that's actually how they bill it and everything else, I don't know. I'm just telling you what the statute says. Then there are also sales taxes. So those were your excise taxes. Here are your sales taxes. There is an 8% sales tax on the value of liquor sold for on-premises consumption. So if you go to a restaurant or to a bowling center or a curling center and you buy um, some liquor for on-premises consumption, that 8% of the value of liquor sold 
will be built into the price that you pay. So it's charged to the consumer, but it's collected by the on-premises retailer. There's also a, five, a, a different 5.5% tax sales tax if it's sold for off-premises consumption. So that will be paid again when you go to your agency liquor store if you're buying spirits or a grocery store, which is usually an agency liquor store, although perhaps it doesn't have to be, and you buy malt liquor or wine, you're gonna pay that 5.5% sales tax because you're purchasing it for off-premises rather than on-premises consumption. And again, remember those wine direct shippers that Representative Kayazo referred to earlier. So they're selling and shipping products directly to a consumer. It's in the consumer's home. So it's off of the premises of the retailer. So that's an off-premises consumption example. So that's the 5.5% tax. It's not an on-premises 8% sales tax. So those are your sales taxes. Are there any questions about the excise or sales taxes? Wow, I've made everybody speechless. That's <laughs> That's a very handy chart to have for this. Uh, Representative McCrate. You know, uh, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. I'm actually listening to two meetings at the same time, so just if I'm yelling, that, I apologize. Janet, I just want to um, say this is so incredibly helpful. And not only did you do the charts, you numbered the pages. I'm so excited. Thank you. Creation that unique it's really helpful. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. So you could say, uh, you could you could prevent an air uh, water. Oh, here we go. Sorry, I, yep. Representative Tuttle. Yes, uh, Janet, I promise to call you Janet from now on. <laughs> it's okay. My parents call me Kate because that's my older sister's name. I'll remember that. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jen. Is that it for your presentation? I'm talked out. Okay. <laughs> I think I get extra dry when I'm talking on Zoom, it seems like. Now, that was really helpful. And I think those will be good forms and resources for us to have once we start getting into liquor bills because we have quite a few, it looks like coming this session and a lot we'll talk about taxes and the, the entire discussion around the municipal bond bank and the liquor revenues will be a really big discussion in the coming weeks for the budget. So that's kind that's of great. how it's all working. I did want to say one thing. So I know that I have Representative Tuttle's question about the premium tax to just see what was repealed in 2013, what happened then. But I don't remember any other questions because the consumer tax is just a pricing formula that's set per each bottle kind of differently. So were there any other questions I for follow-up that I missed? Okay, good. I think that's good. Great. And so that does it for our agenda today. Uh, we're not meeting on Friday, as our uh, calendar says, but we will pick up on Monday with uh, looks like four public hearings, and we'll plan to do some work sessions on those two gambling control unit bills that we heard earlier in the week. Um, Representative Tuttle. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank Karen Montel for putting up with my confusion in the early days of the legislature. She will have me trained, I'm sure, by the end of the session. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. It's been for everything today. It's been a busy day. And we all have to retrain to adapt to this Zoom thing. Great. Are there any other issues? So uh, seeing none, we will adjourn for today and we'll see everybody on Monday. So have a good one, everyone. <laughs> the last shall be first, Kevin.